Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. Today is the first official turkey podcast that we're doing of 2024. So we're excited about it. We got a really good one planned. Uh, we got the ginger bow hunter, Jacob Myers, here. Doing well. Doing well. Andrew, yes, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty we got, good. Got done shooting some quail this morning, by the yeah, way. Yeah, we shot some quail this morning, shot a snipe this morning. It was pretty fun. So we, we'll talk about that on Thursday. Uh, but we got some special guests, man. We got Mr. Barry Smith. Barry, how are you doing? Doing great. Glad, good to see you all. Yeah, glad, to be, glad that you're here. Uh, Benny, Mr. Ben George, uh, Barry is your cousin, and you've been on the podcast a couple times, so you get mentioned all the time because I always tell people you're my mentor, you're like my adoptive father when it comes to deer hunting and really any kind of hunting, uh, and today we're going to talk a little bit of turkey, but uh, Benny, how are you doing? I'm doing well, doing doing very well, just been running my beagles and shooting some rabbits and got lucky enough to kill a couple of nice bucks this year. Yeah, you killed a really, really nice buck this year, actually. We're, we're, we might have to talk about that at some point. Maybe not on this episode, but I definitely want to talk about it because uh, you actually found that deer, just to kind of tease the, the listeners a little bit, you found that deer by rabbit hunting, right? I mean, you were running your beagles and you saw him? Yeah, um, I, I actually, there's two more bucks over there that I've got in mind. But uh, I found this one. I was over there uh, just scouting some new areas to... Uh, rabbit hunt and I live near there so and I'm semi-retired so I go over there one afternoon and I looking at a certain area you could see a long way and I see this big deer about 4 15 p.m. standing out there and I go man that's got to be a nice buck I get my pick up my binoculars uh, of course it wasn't a gun hunting day so I had no uh, firearm other than my p- pistol with me and I watch him and watch him, and he was a nice buck, and they were going to have a gun hunt that uh, Thursday through Sunday, I think. And uh, I said, well, I probably won't see him, but I'm going to go over there and I'm going to hunt him. And uh, saw him that morning about 7.45, and something went wrong. like It does a lot of times. I don't know if he winded me or I moved a little too quick. Went back that afternoon and uh, killed him about 10 minutes before. Uh, dark before it got dark and uh, mm-hmm. it just worked out it's just one of those times where it worked out yeah i'll have to cut a picture of that deer in that was a stud what were you about to say yeah no I- i'm excited to talk to you guys uh kind of kicking off turkey season here one thing i'm interested in and i want to get both of y'all stories but barry i want to start with you what was your intro into turkey hunting like was it really young as a child or was it a little bit later on in life it was young as a child uh, uh probably I'd say 13 years old or so, you know, to kind of dabble with it a little bit and, you know, got interested in it, just uh, uh, didn't know enough about it. But, uh, you know, I was, I was telling them uh, uh, earlier, uh, I, I dabbled for a few years with it. And then as I got older, I had I had some three girls come along. And uh, so I, I quit for a while, quit fishing some, quit quit doing a whole lot of anything but chasing them around doing their things. So after they got a little older and started driving on their own, I said, man, you know, turkey hunting is, is, is always a turkey gobble always affected me hard, so I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back into this, and I'm going to learn uh, what I need to learn. I'm going to get with the right people, and, you know, and, I, and I, as luck would have it, I did. I was able to get with people and, you know, show me along, and so <laughs> I, uh, I've, it's, it's helped me a whole lot, you know, just being with the right people. But let me ask you this, and I'm going to ask, uh, Benny, I'm going to ask you some of these same questions, too, but Barry, did you have, like, a certain mentor or anybody that kind of taught you turkey hunting, or was it just as a kid you found out there was a hunting season, you just try to go hunt them? Well, as I got older, like I say, as I got older and and, and, and uh, uh, dedicated myself, I was going to learn to be a turkey hunter. There was a guy I worked with, and uh, his dad was a big turkey hunter, you know, and, and uh, just hearing hearing their stories, I knew he was, a you know, a, a A1 turkey hunter. So as luck would have it, I was able to get with him and hunt some during the week and, you know, and learn as as, as progress, you know, as progressing as, as, as much as I could. And... Uh, so he, he's a, his his name's Ricky Gant, and I give him the credit for me, you know, because he he just uh, took me under his wing and and showed me a lot, and and uh, I'll never forget it. You know, I hope I hope I can uh, pass that on to someone else. What was that first year like? What was the date uh, when you really started getting back in turkey hunting? It was hard? Uh, probably about two thousand. Uh, mm, let's say two thousand seven, two thousand six, two thousand seven. A year right in there, and uh, uh, from about two thousand six, two thousand seven up till. Uh, probably the f- four years 
following that. And I just, you know, I took in a lot, you know, just learning a lot, asking a lot of questions. You know, he was showing me different calls, uh, learning to run, run the different mouth calls, you know. And, and uh, like I said, he just took me under his wing, which I, that's what I, I was needing. I was hoping to find somebody, and he did. So I, I'll, give him, I'll give him all the credit for me, you know, that, 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 uh, that showed me the ropes on what I needed to learn. Yeah. What What about when you were like a little kid, I guess, and, and you first kind of got interested in it, then you said you got out of it, you know, when you had your girls and, and you know, fatherly duties, you know, it gets in the way of that stuff sometimes. That's but, right. but when you were a kid, uh, like really early on, uh, like, did you have, did you know anybody back then that was turkey hunting or did you just kind of strike out, you know, by yourself doing it? I mean, being you a fella, his name was Charles Raymond, that, uh, that he kind of took us under his wing before, you know, at, at, a, at a young age and, and he was a big turkey hunter. Um, you know, I didn't get the one-on-one, uh, a lot from him, but you know, just a lot of hearsay stuff and, you know, and, and wanted to follow in his footsteps, but it was just a learning, you know, learning experience. And, you know, you get, back then, you know, I, if I, if I heard a turkey gobble, I was more than likely going to booger him up pretty quick, you know. I was going to spook him. He was going to know I was there. I was calling, you know, some kind of calls. I don't know what kind, you know. So, But more than likely, he was running away from me rather than coming to me. Yeah, that sounds about like me today. <laughs> uh, and now I want to pitch that over to you, Ben. Uh, growing up, what what was turkey hunting like for you? Because I was telling Jacob earlier, when me and Colt were growing up, we, we did turkey hunt with you, but it wasn't like a, the emphasis that we had on deer hunting. You know, like we didn't really, we got after the deer and the squirrels and the rabbits, but we didn't get after the turkeys quite as hard. Or me and Colton did, especially when we were like younger teenagers. But uh, but what what was that like for you, uh, like especially early on in life, turkey hunting? Well, it's like Barry said, uh, he and I grew up where we grew up, there, there wasn't any deer close by. Then we squirrel hunted, and, and, and you know I've emphasized this about if you teach a kid to squirrel hunt, uh, what I call slip hunting or what a lot of people call still hunting. They, they can go anywhere and hunt anything. They just have to take that knowledge and apply it to what they're hunting. And he and I both were very fortunate to have some good mentors. Uh, Charles Raymond was a good turkey hunter, but like Barry said, you know, he, he – Probably didn't tell us everything. I mean, you know, he'd, but uh, like a good turkey hunter. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and and uh, I remember in high school. Uh, I don't know if you remember it, Barry, but you had gone down near Cahaba River in a uh, that morning. I think we both skipped school that day, which wasn't unusual <laughs> to hunt. Uh, but you had gone down there and you had a bird gobbling, gobbling, like you said. You know, we didn't know what we were doing. And he just couldn't get it to, uh, to come in. And he made the mistake of telling me where he had that bird going. I went down there and hit the call about twice and killed the bird because, as we all know, when that bird gets ready, he, gonna, he might run over you. Other times, you, you can't make him come in. <laughs> but anyway, turkey hunting, uh, I was always more into the deer. And I love to turkey hunt, and I've killed turkeys. But Barry is definitely a more dedicated turkey hunter than I, um, and I love it, and I'll be in Kentucky soon, and I've got a little piece of property that I do pretty good on uh, down the road here, and uh, I love it, but uh, I told a buddy of mine a while back, I said if I could go on a hunt and kill four or five big swamp rabbits or kill a great big gobbler, I'd probably take the swamp rabbits, and he said, you have lost your mind. <laughs> <laughs> and about 95% of our listeners agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I'm I'm curious, too. Like, Benny, we were looking at pictures uh, upstairs earlier of, like, you when you were a kid with, you know, squirrels here, swamp rabbits there. It's, you know, 1975 or so, or some of those pictures. Yeah, 69, 70, 69. 72. Back yeah. in the day. Yeah. So – what I'm curious about turkey hunting, like back then, like what what was your dad's involvement in turkey hunting? My dad didn't didn't ever hunt turkeys until he retired, and then he fell in love with it and killed, you know, I'm gonna say five or six good birds. But he he worked a whole lot, and he was only off on Wednesdays and Sundays, I think. And uh, now Barry can tell you, we both were blessed with dads that loved the outdoors, and that's what got us into it. And boy, I give those guys a lot of credit and then some other mentors that we went to church with uh, and just, just just had the blessing of knowing older men that were willing to put us in the truck and take us hunting mm -hmm. you know and a lot of times they just tell you a little bit and put you out in the woods and 
you know, here it is, boys, here's the woods, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, so Barry and I grew up, uh, I can remember, Barry, I'm sure you do, we got out of school. We might not have had an hour before it got dark. Man, we throw our hunting clothes on, grab a 410 shotgun, run to the woods, and if we killed a squirrel or two, that's a big deal. So we just kind of learned, you know, trial and error. It, it's, it's just, you know, it, it was. It's been a great life. The outdoors has. It's been a great life. I think Barry would agree. Yeah, it's, it's been, been a great. blessing. It's been great. Like I say, he said, uh, like he said, we, well, you know, we we might not have thirty minutes to hit the woods in the afternoon after school, but we just about every day we was gonna do it. We'd oh yeah, be there. yeah. We'd compete. If you remember, we'd oh, we'd yeah. save our squirrel tails. See who killed the most in the year. I don't know if Barry remembers that. <laughs> oh, but, I, do. I do. But that was a good thing. That's that's a good thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, I, I did that, too, when I was a kid. Like, my mom just loved the fact that I'd take squirrel tails and I'd tack them to the wall. Oh, yeah. And yeah, have, like, so. 30 squirrel tails, like, rotten. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wall. yeah, that would, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, my yeah. mom was thrilled about that. And yeah, and y'all are just generalists, so it's like, yeah, if y'all were, you know, if it was spring, y'all were going to go hunt tur turkeys. If it was fall, you were going to go rabbit hunt or maybe deer hunt. Mm -hmm. Squirrel uh, hunt, too? Whoa, now. Yeah, squirrel Don't hunt. Don't forget about squirrels. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, squirrels are probably... Wouldn't you say? Probably the biggest thing. I mean, I, I think so. Growing I, up, know, I mean, as I kids. I think so. You know, the season didn't come in like it does now, as early as it does now. It didn't come into like, you know, late October, where it comes in a lot earlier now. But, you know, so when squirrel season was in, we were, you know, that was that was where we was going to be uh, any chance we got. And Back then, was there a lot of people, <clears throat> when y'all were kids specifically, like grade school, high school, stuff like that, was there a lot of people that big game hunted like deer and turkeys, or was it still mostly small game? Uh, number one thing in the 70s was squirrel. I mean, I remember reading in a magazine in the late 70s, it said number one hunted animal in Alabama squirrels. Behind that was quail and rabbits because, uh, bearing to you, I mean, you had to go to certain counties uh, to, to even find a deer, find a deer track. So you you give your input on that? Oh right? yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, most most of the people we grew up with went to school. They were either squirrel or rabbit hunter. You know, I mean, if they if they had a privilege of hunting with somebody, that had a bird dog. But as far as a big game hunting deer, uh, turkeys, they were you know they weren't that many people that that we hung with in our groups. It was was what we call big game hunting. It was mm -hmm. mostly small game. But uh, you know, like I say, we had to go south. You know, from where we lived. To, to see a deer track you know you don't see them like you do in the neighborhoods in their backyards anymore like you do now but you know so we had to go south to even see a deer track you know i, I don't know if y'all could recall this but i know i can remember the first time i heard a gobble first time ever turkey hunting ever heard a gobble do y'all happen to remember one of those first times you you might have heard a gobble whether you were actually turkey hunting or maybe on one of your first hunts I do. I, I remember, but I mean, I wasn't turkey hunting. I was on the river, on the on the river, and you know, it just uh, I wasn't too. It wasn't too far from me, but I was in a boat, you know, and I mm -hmm. I could just remember it plain as day, you know. And, <laughs> and I was thinking, man, that's 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 an awful sound. That got, you know, it just you know, it was close enough to where you got you inside your, you could feel it inside, you know. So yeah, I can remember the first one that I heard gobble. It was down the Warrior River, probably, you know. So. What about you, Benny? Mm, I think the first one I heard gobble was down near Cahaba River, and I think I was. Uh, Actually, it's probably a young bird because, you know, they'll gobble in the fall sometime. Um, and I think I heard a, you know, I'm sure it's probably a young bird because they, they're feeling it out. You know, when I heard it gobble, I squirrel. And I had heard about turkey gobbles, and I don't remember what age it was. But, but I heard something, and I thought, well, that's that's got to be a turkey gobble. But like Barry said, we didn't have where we grew up in, in this part of the state. Uh, you didn't see a deer track and. I don't remember seeing turkeys. I mean, it just, you know, it was all small game, quail, rabbits, uh, squirrels. I mean, and then, boy, once the deer took off and turkeys took off, they were everywhere at some point. I mean, you know, so. Uh, well, we, we hunted, we actually hunted uh, work management areas now that we used to be public land or you know permit land what we used to do with permit land so a lot of that we hunted back in, you know in the day but way before management area come along you know and they wasn't you know uh as we got a little older they started to be some deer there and, and we killed a couple good ones over there uh back then and but you for us turkeys you didn't see many of those back over there then occasionally you would but not 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 like you would now yeah <clears throat> that was the next thing i was going to ask about was uh well that's pretty common to hear uh, you know, back in the 70s and maybe even in the 80s that most people, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, that uh, like everyone from, from y'all's generation and, and my grandparents' generation, like y'all's parents, 
uh, they would talk about back, you know, if they were going to go deer hunting, they were do- going to the Black Belt. You know, they were going somewhere down Perry County, Dallas County, somewhere like that, Montgomery, um, because that's where all the deer were. But I've all I've been curious about the turkey aspect of it too, because uh, like rem- remind the audience like where where did y'all grow up like geographically in Alabama? Uh, we grew we grew up and uh, we had a big family, so we grew up all, uh, most of our most of the whole street we lived on was was family, and we were, we lived over in Lipscomb, Lipscomb, Alabama, okay. which is you know just a rural part of Jefferson County. But uh, mm-hmm. you know uh, we, we grew up there, and and as we got older, you know we kind of started splitting and going different directions, but. For the most part, we we grew up there, and and uh, man, there was some strips of woods that you know we 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 could walk through them at night time without a flashlight. We knew them so well, so you know. But we we squirrel hunted those woods, rabbit hunted those woods, and killed a lot of, a lot of small game on that that property. But there again, there was no you know there's deer on that property and turkey on that property now, but back then, if, you know, you wouldn't see a deer track or or a turkey turkey track on it back then. Yeah, so y'all were just kind of rolling with the punches like as the deer started showing up you started hunting the deer as the turkey started showing up you started hunting the turkeys is that kind of how it worked oh yeah yeah we uh yeah we you know, like i said we started hunting really deer hunting i i think for, for me it was probably around 1973 74 you know when i first but we were going to you know uh, perry county yeah to go south bibb county perry they county weren't for right. us you know yeah. and you know there again we had those mentors we wasn't driving at that age so you know we were we were hitchhiking but <laughs> you know if they, if they had room in the truck for us we were going you know and then as as we got older and got you know started getting our own vehicles and you know, dogs, and you know, then we had we had a group that was going to meet, you know, down that way every weekend and hunt Saturday and Sunday. You know, we were we were we were dog deer hunting back then. That was dog, yeah. Dog deer hunting was big in Alabama at that time. Yeah. Okay, I got you. So some of those older guys kind of get back onto the turkey hunting subject. Uh, you know, you're talking about these these older gentlemen who took you guys out and kind of showed you the ropes when it came to uh, like those old turkey hunters, like guys who liked to turkey hunt. Uh, you know, turkey hunters are kind of famous for being pretty secretive. You know, everything's <laughs> close to the chest. What What were they like, man? Like, what did they What did they tell you about turkey hunting? I mean, did they just kind of drop you off and and just say good luck? I mean, what kind of advice were you getting from those old timers? Ah, uh, yeah, for me, like, like I said a while ago, my mentor. You know, one of my mentors was his name was Charles Raymond, which you know he had some good places and he worked for a railroad, so he had flexible off days. He worked. He was a lot off during the week a lot, so he didn't have to compete on public land with you know with a whole lot of hunters. But he would you know he would carry us and he'd give us just enough instructions to to put you out there on your own. But uh, you know he wasn't gonna he wasn't gonna tell you too much because you know he was just a he was full fledged turkey hunter, so <laughs> you were limited on what you were gonna get out of him. Mm-hmm. Is it the same for you? Yeah, same thing. And I hunted with the same guy, and uh, uh, I think I told you on the last punk two two of the very best turkey hunters I ever knew was uh, Jerry Barnett. Mm-hmm. And Jerry wasn't going to tell you nothing. No, no. <laughs> I mean nothing. No, no. Um, like describe his personality when it came to turkey hunting. He's a guy I told you that could, and I think Barry, if you remember it, he's a guy that would disappear into the woods and you might not see him to that night. If he got tired, he'd lay down, go sleep, take a nap, get up, let's just start hunting again. He just lived in the woods. And I learned a lot just by, he he reminded me, if you ever watch a cat hunt, birds like slipping, stopping, slipping, stopping, Jerry was that kind of guy. I would have, you know, he, he, he was, uh, he just he just became part of the woods, and some of the best hunters I know that's what they do. They just become a part of the woods. And Jerry Barnett, now you know, for all those, whatever I learned from here, him was just from being around him and watching him. Uh, but he wasn't gonna tell you nothing. And then uh, Eugene Peel, I don't think Barry ever knew him, but later he had rabbit dogs. But he was. I used to tell people, I would hate to be a gobbler <laughs> with Eugene Peel or Jerry Barnett after me because you're going to die. <laughs> because they'd live with you. Eugene Peel, buddy, if he got a gobbler in his head, he'd liable to kill him at 1 o'clock in the day or 4 in the afternoon or it, it, right after daylight. But once he got a bird in his head, I said, boy, I'd hate to be that gobbler because I'd be afraid to do anything because <laughs> he's going to be in the woods with you. And uh, I got a picture of him I'll show you in a little while with a buck he killed. He was great with beagles. He loved rabbit hunting. And he killed a many, many a deer. But turkey hunting was his absolute love. And he was a guy, I told you, that was in the shot the gobbler out of the deep freeze that time. 
Oh, you said you don't was, remember that he story? Was, oh, I remember that. He was like hunting off muleback well, no, or no. something right there, wasn't it? On the last podcast we did, he hunted where the <laughs> management area is now over there on one of the gas lines. I could show you right where it is. But years ago, before it was a management area, it was U.S. Steel and you get a permit. Well, Eugene Peel was a sure enough turkey hunter. Well, one of the things he'd do during the day was get on that gas line, and he told me he was a woodsman. He could do it all, anything. He was a good fisherman. He just a Daniel Boone, modern-day Daniel Boone. He said, get on that gas line. He said, when you top a hill, don't you just be standing up because game, whatever over that hill, they're going to recognize you as human. He said, get down on your belly and peek over that hill. Well, he did that, and he's a big gobbler down the bottom. That was like late in the morning. He's just walking that gas line. He said he hit whatever kind of call he had. He, I, I mean, I couldn't tell you. But he hit the call, and you know how some gobblers just come running to you. He said this gobbler just gobbles and comes running to him, and he's like, oh, my God, I got to. I mean, you know, I got to get off this gas line set up. And he said somebody don't tell no deep freeze there. And he just rolled up in that deep freeze. And at that time, he had a browning, uh, uh, brown and gold 10 gauge, which is a little much. But <laughs> he rolls up in that deep freeze. He said, buddy, that gobbler's coming. He said, I didn't have to call again. He said, gobbler comes running by him. I, last thing in the world, that gobbler would have expected somebody to be laying up that deep freeze. <laughs> and I told him, I said, Eugene, you are the only man, I'll guarantee you, the only man it's ever killed a gobbler out of a deep freeze with a brown and tin <laughs> <laughs> But that's true. I guarantee it's true. That man didn't, I mean, you just have to know Eugene. He, he used to keep me, when he got old, I would drive for him. We'd go on rabbit hunts. His legs would go to sleep. So I'd drive and we'd go down to Selma. And all. He would keep me laughing about old stories. He, he was one of the best woodsmen I ever knew. He was kind of like Barry, you know, like Jerry Born out. He'd get in the woods. But he just became, he used to tell me, son, you got to become part of the woods. And you get woods. He said, you stand up against a tree or lay down beside it, whatever. He said, you just become a creature in the woods. And boy, I never forgot that. You become a creature in the woods, you kill, you'll kill more game than just driving up to a shooting house. You know, so anyway, I, I won't say no more. Y'all ask Barry questions. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great to have people like that yeah. in your life. You look back. Yeah. A lot of days when I'm hunting, I'll be sitting in Kentucky and I think about something like that and I just smile. Oh, yeah. I'm, th I'm saying thank you for giving me this life that I got. You know what I mean? Really? I just say thank you. They're going on now, but and I know you feel the same way. Oh, right? yeah, absolutely. Those, those, old, those old guys that we're, we're talking about, man, are just, you know, like I say, they were, they were part of the woods, you know. Uh, you might see them at daylight and you might not see them again in the dark, you know, but they, they just... Uh, they they were woodsmen uh, from you know and and uh, you know I, I give them the credit for, for 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 us you know a lot of what we we were able to learn was through people like that and mentors that that took us under their wings. Yeah, absolutely. I but just real quick on Eugene, you know, like I grew up hearing about from Eugene from you, uh, and I never got to meet him, so I don't know like when he passed away or whatever. But like, what generation was he from? Out of curiosity, like when was when was he born? Do you remember? Uh Boy, I should know this, and I wish I'm still friends with his son, Alan. Um, Eugene died about uh, ten years ago. He was 85 when he died. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so he's probably born in the 1930s. Or yeah, so. yeah. He used to hunt off a mule over there, what is management area now. When people thought there wasn't a turkey anywhere around there, he killed a few turkeys over there. Uh, even back then, and then they really weren't. I mean, I didn't think it was turkeys even in the sixties and seventies around there. But uh, uh, he he was a, uh, and he did it all, man. He fished Cobb River, and he knew more about floating that Cobb River and catching fish than anybody you'd ever want to meet. I mean, he was just a wealth of knowledge. But I'll tell you this about Eugene: he sized you up when you met you, and if he didn't care for you, he wasn't telling you nothing. But if he liked you, he you know, he'd take you in under his wing, and uh, so that's just the way he was. And uh, he worked, he retired from the coal mines, down number seven coal mine. And, uh, you know, he he was just one of them old, uh, boy, he was a, when he was a young man, he was like a, he was a bear of a man, big man. He couldn't hardly get through that door right there. And, 
anyway, he was just one just one of those mentors. So yeah, uh, Barry, kind of going back to you on the again on the turkey stuff. Uh, so like we kind of covered what it was like growing up uh, down here with turkeys and and kind of going to get back into it. And one thing you mentioned to me when we were talking upstairs earlier was again just kind of on the same subject of having that guy who'd take you and be a mentor and how that made like all the difference for you as a turkey hunter so like when you got out you know after your daughters grew up a little bit and you were able to start getting back out i mean what was that process like trying to basically learn how to turkey hunt and then finding guys who you know showed you what to really do like versus what you thought you were supposed to be doing well, I'll tell you, uh, when you got lands, you can find somebody to turkey hunt with, you know, a lot of times if you got access to land. So I had access to some good land, and it wasn't overly hunted. We we got a lot of we got a lot of property, and it's not, you know, we got turkey hunters, but it's not just overly, overly, you know, overrun with hunters. So, uh, the, you know, the guy I mentioned earlier, Mr. Gant, Ricky Gant, he, uh, uh, he and his, he and his his son were and I were good friends, and so. Uh, you know, once he found out I had some some good turkey access, and uh, and he knew I was wanting to learn, you know, I was committed to learning. It all came together. Uh, him 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 going down there with me, you know, and killing a, a, a number of turkeys with me over the years down there, and then and and then in return I was killing some, but I was also learning a whole lot, you know, from him. Uh, just uh, uh, you know, I I don't think I could substitute it for anything. Just the knowledge I've learned from him, you know, just uh, being with somebody that's that's this you know turkey hunter for you know 50 60 years got a lot of experience under his belt mm -hmm. yeah definitely well, <clears throat> what was some of those things early on that he taught you that maybe was like an aha moment or just like made sense after applying some of um it? not over calling you know I, and i think i still probably do and he does too he admit he does too but i think you know that's one thing just over over, over calling a lot you know or um I, you know, I used to try to get too close to a turkey. You know, when I, you know, I like to get close to close as I can on a roost. You know, to to cut the distance from him. But I, you know, I think I, I know I had sp 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 spooked turkeys trying to get too close in on them, especially when you know in the early season when the woods are not are not not full yet. But uh, you know, uh, just a lot of lot of things like that. Just little things that you know that that uh, that I that I didn't see in myself doing that that you know that with hunting with him I could see you know he don't he don't go in the woods doing an owl hooting you know I mean he don't he don't do that uh, and if he and if he has to he will but you know what we what we like to do is you know hopefully they're gonna gobble on the roost and he's not gonna know an owls even in the woods nowhere around him so we're gonna try to get close as we can to him and and I still do that you know I don't I don't I don't owl hoot or you know uh, you know unless it's on up in the morning or something and things are slow so um just you know, just different little odd and end things that that I had done that that I started hunting with him and he didn't do. So I just you know just continued to do that. It's, it's, so far, it's working out pretty good. Is he <laughs> is he still around or has he passed? You no, know, he's he's around. He, he's around. He's he's uh he still hunts with me some. How old is he now? He's he's upper sixties. He's not okay. you know he's not an older fellow. He retired from the coal mines also at a, you know at a fairly young age. So he's he's been able to you know to uh, to have a lot of. Um, access to hunting during the week too you know at, at different places but like i say at our place we we don't have that many turkey hunters we have a little more on the weekends than we do during the week but we got a good many retired guys that hunts during the week but uh so he he hunts with me a, a good bit and his son does too him him and his son hunts with me a good bit during the week at our place i might want to get him on the podcast <laughs> he sounds like he'd be an interesting guy he is he's, he's fascinating he's, he's fascinating he's just a, you know just a uh I mean, he deer hunts just for something to do. But I mean, he's you know, turkey season those forty-five or whatever days it is. That's what he lives for. You know, that's that's, that's his thing. That's his passion. And his son runs got rabbit dogs, and and he he goes with them some. But I mean, his 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 uh his bread and butter is the turkey hunting. So what what was some other lessons that you learned after hunting with him? Maybe for a few seasons, like things that maybe the subtle things that you picked up on him doing that maybe he didn't even tell you, but like it changed the way you looked at turkey hunting. Um, uh, just, you know, just, um, uh, um, like he said, you know, he said, you ain't gotta be just great on a call. You know, I don't, you know, I think people try to be over, over, you know, you know over, overdo a call, you know, but you know, I've heard hens that sound worse than me, you know, <laughs> and, and that's pretty bad. But, you know, that's about what I, I was about to say. <laughs> I hear some awful hens. But you know, <laughs> I, mean, I don't think you got a bad grade. He, he, his, his, his thing is running a mouth call. He's probably, you know, he's the best that I've heard. You know, he can run, he can run a mouth call. And I mean, it's just amazing to, to know that he's making that sound come out of his mouth, you know, and, and he's taught me a lot, you know, I didn't know how to run a mouth call too well. Um, and I still probably don't, 
too well, but I mean, I can get by with it. But but he's helped me. You know, he went one one year after season one out. I told him, I said, look, I said, I want before next spring, I want I want you to spend some time with me running a mouth call, and he did. You know, and he he kind of guided me on what I needed, and so we 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 pretty much just run a cutter mouth call. You know, it's pretty easy to blow, and and uh, so just you know just subtle things like that, just a. Uh, uh, the commitment I had to run a mouth call, you know, I, I, you know, even in the summer months, I'd go to his house after work or, you know, we'd sit on his carport and blow a mouth call, you know, and he, ah, you need to do this, you need to do that. You're putting too much air, too much air here, too much air there. And so just, you know, just little things that, like that, 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 that uh, it's gone a long way for me. You know, I was joking with a guy that one of my buddies this morning, <clears throat> we were out quail hunting this morning and uh, we were talking about turkey season coming up and everything. And we, you know, we just got back from Nashville from the NWTF convention, and they got the Grand Nationals up there. And they have those guys on stage who, I mean, sound more like a turkey than a turkey. And they got the uh, that beautiful two-tone yelp, clean front end, raspy back end where it breaks in the middle, just, like, beautiful. And I tried for, like, years to be able to do that. And I got to where I could do it, especially on, like, a cutter-type call or, like, a combo cut-type call. And uh, I was telling him, I, I do that in the woods, and I never get a response from it. But, you know, you send the air, you know, off the side of the call, like, to get that clean front note, and then you break it over with the rasp. And I'm like, man, I'll just send the air right down the middle of the call and just make the whole thing a one-toned, awful, raspy swamp hen. And that's what they always respond to, you know. Um, no matter how hard I try to do, like, the pretty yelp, it just... I don't know why it just never works for me. You know, a lot of that stuff to me, is, you know, is 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 for the stage. You know, uh, on the stage, you know, they're 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 competing. You know, they're they're competing. They're getting judged. You know, but uh, you know, like I say, I, I've heard I've heard a good many hens that sounded worse than me, and uh, you know, and they got and got and they were toting around gobblers behind them. So, <laughs> so you know, I figured if I if I can be somewhat around what they they are, maybe even a little better at times, then I, I should be okay. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. rem that reminds me of something. I mean, of course. They don't remember Ben Lee, but mm -hmm. of course me and you do. That's right. he was one for, I, I got the opportunity one time to hunt with him, and and I got to know him, and uh, but he told and he won the world championship one time, Colin. But he's saying what Barry said. He said I do better uh, when I'm just doing it like I did growing up than I do. He said at these competitions, you're not calling turkeys, you're calling the judges. In other words, you're trying to impress the judges. And he said, truth is, you don't have to be that good. I mean, you know, he said a lot of hens sound just like people. They sound different. And he said, you know, the bird's either ready to come or he ain't. I mean, you know, uh, he said a lot of world champion turkey callers uh, are not that good at calling actual turkeys in. They're, they're, they're trying to impress the judge. That's right. I you know, so. and I mean, I, I was telling Barry, I, I, boy, I'm, I'm telling you, I've killed gobblers, but that's probably my weakest point. I'm better at deer, and then that's not bragging. I just know where my where my wheelhouse is. I know what I'm better at at figuring out a deer than I am figuring out a gobbler. But I've killed them. But I went down on that little piece of property I got down the road here one day. I never hunt in the afternoon for turkeys. Went down there and man, just just hit my slate call one time. I had two birds answer. And them some guns flew to each other and start fighting out in front of me. Just that easy. <laughs> now, who can explain that? You know, <laughs> it sure wasn't because of my good calling, but they were just ready to, they were in a bad mood, whatever, and want to fight each other. And I killed one of them only because they were 100 yards away, and they fight and fight, and they flop off in the bushes fighting each other. <laughs> I said, well, here's my chance to get close. I, boy, I jump out, and I, I take off run down the road. And I just flop down on my belly. That's something Eugene Pill told me. Uh, you know, if you're standing up or sitting up, they, they see you. They know what you are. I just laid down on my belly. I said, they'll come back out here in a minute. Sure enough, they come out there fighting. I kill one of them. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, and it sure wasn't because I was a good caller. I might have hit the call twice or three times, but I got them worked up. And who knows why a turkey does what it does. Sometimes you cannot get him in range. Other times he'll run slap over you. I mean, yeah. You, you had, buck, a buck same way, you know, yeah. smartest buck in the world sometimes, just an idiot. You know, I mean, he just, he's in rut, he's worked up, and he just, you know, I mean, he just, and I think that's what happened on that management this year. I just caught one that was loving that spot, and that's really what, in my mind, I wasn't running cameras or nothing, but I, but I told Alan, I told Randy Forster, I said, I got a feeling that buck can be killed 
and he's right there. And Andrew can tell you some places I hunt over there mm-hmm. are the most unlikely places you would think. Yep. And this buck, I was surprised when I drove in there that morning hunting that there wasn't trucks sitting there. And them guys running the cameras probably had him on camera. But some, And here it goes back to growing up small game. Something told me that buck is hanging right here. He's like a gobbler that gets to love in a spot too much. I went right in there and killed him, not because I'm good, but because when you grow up small game hunting like we did, you get that sixth sense that, that this is where I need to be. And uh, I don't know. Well, turkey same way. It just mm-hmm. so anyway. Yeah, but uh, Barry, what's your what's your uh, thoughts on that? Like your your small game upbringing. I'm curious on your thoughts about like how does that serve you today? Like especially in the turkey woods. Uh, just you know, just being a just being a a part of the woods, you know, and 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 blending in, uh, taking you know taking uh, taking nature, you know, as it presents itself to you. Uh, you know, turkey hunting's a, a little bit different than squirrel hunting. You know, I, like I say, I, I like to, uh, I like to, of course, be there at daylight. You know, and, and hear one gobbler and, and get close to him as I can. But, you know, but just, you know, just this, everything small game hunting that we that we done game, game hunting just give you the, the woods knowledge. You know, that that I don't think I would have got otherwise if I hadn't. For example, the kids nowadays, including my grandkids, you know, they're watching TV. You know, a lot of them's not small game hunting anymore. They're, you know, they're 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 being put on a green field or sitting on a corn pile now. So they're, you know, they're missing out on on the small game hunting. Mm-hmm. And it uh, and to me, that's you know, that's where you w- learn a lot of wood knowledge at. You know, uh, that, that otherwise, if you're just going to a shooting house or a green field and sitting on a corn pile somewhere, you're not you're not seeing all that aspect of the, of, of the small game hunt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one one aspect of it that I, I'm kind of curious to bring up and just get y'all's thoughts on is, uh, it, and it relates back to this, it is, and it's that I I grew up doing that too. I grew up small game hunting, and like I tell people nowadays, especially that like I'm I'm 26 years old, so like I'm you know whatever. I, I don't think I'm a millennial. I think I'm a Gen Z. I don't know. I'm like right <laughs> on the line, but uh, but yeah, whatever. So. I didn't like most people in my generation, like everybody I went to school with, except Colton, uh, grew up like one way. And I feel like we grew up way different because we would go, we would go to Colton's grandfather's house and Tell just, my daddy. yeah, and just Uncle Tom. strike out with 22s. I mean, and just go and be gone until Mr. Benny came up and yelled for us at dark or whatever. And uh, I, I feel like not a lot of other guys grew up like that, like in our generation. So, that I feel like that served me growing up and going to hunt other things, and it and to come full circle with like last year turkey hunting. Jacob gave me the nickname Shark Eyes because when when I go into like kill mode, when it's time to kill something, like I get real focused or whatever, like I don't get frazzled. And I think that comes from that small game hunt. And I was I was talking to some other friends about about this, like who deal with like buck fever or or whatever, or they just kind of. Like when the moment happens when you're actually supposed to take the game, they kind of freak out a little bit. And, you know, I mean, that still happens to me too, for sure. Like it happened on that big buck I showed you earlier. Uh, but most of the time it doesn't. Like I'm very cool and collected when a buck comes out, like I shoot him and then I get the, you know, I fall apart or whatever. And I think it comes from just that repetition of, of squirrel hunting. And you go out and you do it, instead of doing it one time a season on a deer, you're doing it six, seven times a morning all season you know growing up and and there's like i don't know that mental factor that that muscle memory there i guess so i mean what is your take on that to actually being able to take game and like the important lessons that you learn from there oh uh, yeah i mean i agree with you on that you know you're, you're talking about being a z, a z millennial or whatever you know but you know you're you're, you're doing the same thing we do you know we're, we're we're a little bit older but you know we were put in the you know we're just put in the woods just like you were and took that took that knowledge you know that uh, that you learned through walk tromping around his his dad's house you know his properties yep. back in there and and uh but same thing but uh you know i i just don't think you can substitute to me you can't substitute that for anything else so uh, um you know i look at my grand like i said i, I look at my grand grand boys now it's deer hunting with me that, that they've not squirrel hunted they've not rabbit hunted you know so and I feel bad for that, but but you know they just uh, it's just way 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 things go now. They they're into ball and the sports and stuff. So by the time they're through with that, it's time to to go in the woods and deer hunting. So that's that's what they do, you know. But uh, uh, 
you know, I just I, I would I would say anybody that it would that would take some young kids in the woods to do small game hunting, rabbit, and squirrel. Um, you know, we even coon hunted. We done a lot of coon hunting on Saturday nights, and and would be late Sunday mornings. You know, where where a lot of our friends were were out doing other things. We were in the woods on Saturday nights coon hunting, <laughs> and uh, so you know, back then we were hunting up in Haleville, Alabama, up there a lot. You know, and and. They wouldn't definitely wasn't no deer much up there really at the time, but you know they had coon hunting clubs up there like like we have deer hunting clubs down there. It was pr- leased up property for coon hunting up there, so we were able to do that a lot. You know, a lot of our Saturday nights year round were spent coon hunting. So just you know, just all that kind of stuff just makes a full turn <laughs> and comes back. But I mean, it's all that's been a good experience for me. Mm-hmm. Benny, what are, your, what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, what you said was dead on about. Uh, when you when you got that game in front of you, um, now sometimes, like Barry said, I get shook up and I mess up. But usually, and it came from squirrel hunting. Um, you remember Dale Smith that worked at Simmons that did a lot of competition shooting. No, uh, me and him shot together some. And he used to tell me he said you shoot in the subconscious. Now he was a little bit deep in the stuff, you know. But but he's right, and what that means is. I told him, I said, you know, when, I, when I'm when i still, I mean, I get excited when I see my that first squirrel in the morning. I see it limb shaking. I said, and I get my crosshairs on him. I empty my mind of everything except his head, where my crosshairs are. And I, I visualize that bullet hitting. I mean, really, I'm serious. Uh, and I do that with, a, I try to do that with a target. So if it's a turkey, or a deer, or a squirrel, or whatever, I automatically, for somehow, like you talk about muscle memory and all, um, I call it getting in my bubble. Everything in the world is gone except me, and let's just say it's a buck, like this year, killing at Nine Point, Kentucky. I do remember this. I had all those deer out there, and you see that deer, I mean, you know when a good buck steps out. Even if you don't see his antlers, you know it's it's a big deer. And I remember he lifted his head, and my mind went into that bubble. There was nothing in this world but that little area I was going to shoot at. I didn't look at the antlers anymore. My mind was made up, I'm going to shoot this deer. And read about snipers in the military. They do that. They said, you got to empty your mind of everything, and there ain't nothing in this world but those crosshairs and that bullet. And if if you shoot enough on pipe, Piper's good shooting in the targets but squirrel hunting you take your 22 and that squirrel stops on that limb and you focus my dad used to tell me and you know my dad was a good shot bear he would tell you you look at his eye or his ear either one you don't see the rest of that squirrel you're shooting at that eye he said you aim small you'll miss small you know you're shooting a small target i found to be true with turkeys I, I don't look at that beard no more. I don't look at. I'm looking at that spot where I want to shoot. And if you aim small, you miss small. Now, having said that, we all get excited sometimes. You know, I mean, but it it really is shooting. What you said, Andrew, you go into a mode. If you can't go into that mode, you're gonna miss a bunch of deer and wound a bunch of deer, and you're gonna miss a bunch of turkey and wound a bunch of turkey. You have to you have to empty everything out of your mind. I used to tell Colton, once you decide you're going to shoot that buck, don't look at his antlers anymore. You've already made your decision. Don't look at a whole deer. Imagine, uh, Steve Ronella used to say, his daddy would tell him, imagine a dot on that deer, like bow hunting, and shoot at that dot. Boy, that's some good advice. Well, that's some good advice. Same way with turkey, whatever you shoot. Yeah, I was talking and, about talking yeah. about squirrel hunting with a, I, I was dog hunting with squirrels so quite a bit the um, well, the past ten or twelve years we had some pretty de- decent dogs anyway I was hunting with a with a guy that was a really good shot open sights now but if he didn't hit him in the head he was disappointed I mean yeah, every, na- yeah. and every now and then he'd hit one in the shoulders or something and he'd be disappointed with himself but most of the time with open sights now and he was on up in age pretty good shooting an open sight twenty two and and, and uh, Nine out of ten times, or, or even ten out of ten, most of the time it was going to be a headshot. Mm. <laughs> man, I got to ask well, on this subject because uh, turkeys are are tough, man. Especially if you're shooting like a like a rib shotgun and you got a big fat bead up there. Because if he's standing at like twenty five, thirty yards, 
your bead is like covering up that turkey. So do you have any tips about just aiming? Like how do you aim small, miss small on a turkey when you're using maybe iron sights on a shotgun or or like like I said, that big fat bead up there? Tell them what you turkey hunt with now. I, well, I'm using the 410 now. I've, I've, I've gone to a 410. I went for a 20 gauge for quite a number. We went from a from a three and a half, 12 gauge to a 20. And, you know, and we we started loading our own TSS before they come factory loads. We gotten 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 uh, connected up with a guy up in North Carolina that that uh, that actually got he's, he's got a lot of the recipes that a lot of these manufacturers are using now that's that's factory mm -hmm. anyway so we, we bought the components we started loading tss so we, we you know back in i don't know what three or four years before you could go to the store and buy tss but anyway long story short uh we, we went from you know my buddy that i hunt with he went from a 10 gauge to a 20 gauge no 12 in between and and uh, so I I was using 20 gauge for a number of years and I still do some but I the last couple of years I've just used nothing but the 410 with the TSS so but um uh, uh, you know it's just a just a game changer that that part of it's a game changer yeah no doubt are you, are you running uh like a red dot sight well, on it now this is my thing now I, I caught myself doing this this is still when I was using the 12 gauge and I missed a couple times up close but I, I caught myself the last time I missed I, I you know I found out what I was doing I was pulling my head off of the off of the rib mm -hmm. and looking over the bead just because just because I wanted to see the turkey fall and so uh, I started talking to a few people because I mean I was kicking myself, boy, and it was a good turkey. And I actually, I actually, I crippled the turkey. You know, I didn't. You know, most of my shot went into a tree limb, a, a little sapling pine. Mm -hmm. So, but I knew exactly what I done when I done it. You know, and so later on I started talking to people, and you know I said, man, I got to do something. So several people told me the red dot, go to the red dot, try the red dot. And for me, it's worked. I've used the red dot ever since, and every turkey gun I've got now has got the same red dot on it. So I mean, that that, that fixed it for me. But you know, like you say, if turkey gets up close, and you got to be careful with the red dots. You know, there's several several different dots that you can get in the in the red dots. You know, if you get the size that's a little bit too big, so, I and mean, he's up close, you won't see anything. You know, it'll 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 it's it'll take the whole whole body of the turkey away almost. You know, but as far as his head, you know, you don't have to shoot far left or far right to miss the turkey nowadays. You know, with this, these chokes and and shot they got now. So, but um, but for me, the red dot fixed my problem. You know, it's just it's just because. You know, I keep my head down on that red dot now more than looking up at the Barry, I had the exact same issue. I'm glad you brought that up about peeking over the top of the uh, of of the barrel and like looking at the bird. And the issue I had, uh, one of the two turkey guns I had before I, the gun I'm using now, it would have such a large bead up front. One was a fiber optic, one was a like a, just a brass bead, but even the brass bead was large. That when that turkey, he might be 30, 35 yards, and it's covering up the whole turkey. So it's like I would peek over the top of the barrel, like just, I mean, just a fraction of an inch, just to kind of check the bird, check the bird. And all of a sudden, the shot would go off while I'm looking over the top of the barrel, and then boom, shoot over the top of the turkey. Well, that's the same thing I was doing, you know. It just, you know, they get up close. You don't, you don't think of a bead, of a bead covering up a turkey, but when he gets up close, you know, you're looking down that rib, and it's, I mean, he's up close, so, you know, you're just, you, you think you got it on him, but you may or may not. But you don't, you know, you can be a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, and you've missed him, you know, or crippled him like I done on the last one I done, but. Um, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I would suggest most people that's, that's having that issue or can see that a red dot. You know, it fixed it for me, and I think it will for other people. Yeah, that's what I did. And the second I, I went to a red dot, um, and, and using uh, one of those Meadow Creek mounts, it uh, actually bolts onto the the rib of the shotgun, so you don't have to drill and tap it. Because I hunt with an over and under shotgun. The um, the one interesting thing about it is. With that red dot, you're able to see the whole turkey at all times. And if, if he's coming through brush, come through cover, anything like that, it's not like you're covering up three quarters of the turkey with the barrel and the bead. You're able to see him at all times, so you can really pick your shots really well. And it, it helped me out a ton. Yeah, I think I think it would. You know, the the three MOA dot is probably you know what I would recommend most people. You can, you know. Uh, when I first went to Red Dot, I didn't know exactly what, you know, so I, I actually called Burris and told him what, you know, what I was looking to do, and they, you know, they right, right away said, oh, you know, three, three MOA is definitely what you want for a turkey hunt, you know, and I know some people use a bigger dot, but there again, to me, it's just, you know, you go back to the beads, you're covering, covering up the turkey when he's when he's close because the dot's so big. Yeah, absolutely, or, especially if he's far, I mean, if he's further, you know, if your gun's capable of shooting 55, 60 yards, that bird gets out of there 50 yards, that dot's going to be, you know, large on that turkey. It's not as precise of a shot, um, you know, whether you're using a 3 MOA, 3MOA dot or a 1MOA dot. Um, and it's just a lot more precision shooting. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think you're right. You know, I, I told when we were at NWTF uh, last week, 
I was telling some guys um, that were having trouble missing birds. I'm like, that. it helped me out a lot. It might not help out everybody, but it helped me out a lot going to a red dot and just feel more confident. And also, when you go pattern the gun, you can adjust that red dot to hit exactly where you want it. Because I had issues with one of my shotguns with some old chokes I had. Uh, I had this, uh, an old 870, and it was not point of impact with the choke I had in it was not down the bead. It was hitting like low left every single time. And it might have just been me shooting, but I had a couple other people shoot it and it was doing that consistently. And, you know, that was before I knew you could mount a, you know, a, a red dot on your gun without having to drill and tap it. If I would have known that, I would have done that now, a what, lot earlier. what gun were you shooting? A Remington 870. Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, you, if you if you tur- shoot enough turkey guns, you'll see a lot of times the point of aim and point of impact not going to match up, you know, especially with these, like I say, tight, tight choke guns. It's going to tail right quick, you know. Cause it ain't gonna throw it out there where you where you having to guess what it is, but cause you know if you're shooting right down your your bead and it's shooting to right or left, you know then then you got if you don't put a dot on there, then you got to remember I got to shoot right yeah. or gotta shoot left to get my you know to get the bulk of my ammo in there. Where whereas that red dot when you put it on there, you then you can adjust you know it'll 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 just like a scope it'll compensate for the left or right. You know, yeah, you, you can get it there. sighted in perfectly just like a scope, and you get shooting exactly the way it needs to. Um, but yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. And that's one thing I've noticed, like if you use like a really cheap choke, I've seen people even online and some of these Turkey Facebook groups that me and Andrew are in, uh, complain about like, man, I just bought some cheap choke from Walmart or whatever, threw in my gun and the point of impact way off from where it should be. Like when I'm looking down the barrel, it's hitting, you know, low right or high right, high left, low left, something like that. And, uh, I think a lot of it has to do to like the machining process of some chokes because not all chokes are made the same. And it's like, if you get a real cheap choke that's not made, you know, to the correct tolerances, it may not be perfectly uh, symmetrical all the way through, and it might be pushing that shot one way or the other as well. It don't take much to make it, you know, to vary. Same like with a rifle, you know, you can take out two identical rifles, you know, one of them may shoot this bullet perfect, and mm-hmm. the other one not shoot it at all, you know, th- throw it left or right, you know, so you find the ammo for, but, but you know, like I say, a choke, uh, uh, same same choke, same manufacturer, same constriction, everything. It might shoot, you know, you, I might take two of them in, in my gun that I'm using, uh, just say my Benelia, I might take an identical choke and it, one of them might shoot different than the other one did. But like I say, with that red dot, I can compensate either way for that, you know. And, and it's just it's just been the perfect thing for me, red dot has been. Yeah. How, by the way, how do you like the, uh, well, now I guess with TSS shells and everything, 410s are crazy capable. Uh, yeah, you know, it's probably going to cost me one day, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, I really, I, I hunt in Nebraska near, every May, so, you know, up there, we, we get in the turkeys, you know, where you can almost see their eyes eyes blinking, you know, pretty close, so uh, but so I, I got pretty comfortable up there shooting a, a 410, and so I brought it down here and started using it here in Alabama some, you know, especially where I'm at down south of Alabama, as, especially as the season gets uh, gets on in the season the wood's sticking up most of the shots are going to be fairly close anyway for where i hunt for the most part yeah but uh so you know I, i'm 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 fine with it uh like i say it's probably going to cost me eventually but you know i'm shooting a single barrel four I, I had an 870 410 i was using and and uh, I, I couldn't really get you know even with a red dot i would just wasn't getting get the pattern of what i wanted out of and, and trying some different shells you know and so a friend of mine said uh you know, he, he had one of the little CVAs is what I got, a little cheap CVA turkey. They called it a turkey 410. That's what they make it for. But, and man, it, you know, it comes with a Jeb's choke, that factory. But, I mean, I'm shooting. I'll show you my pattern after after the podcast here. But, I mean, I'm shooting shooting pretty good at 40, 40 yards. It's, it's stacking them pretty good. So. That's awesome. <laughs> See, I, I, take, I take Ben's uh, advice when it comes to rabbit hunting. I want the most pelts downrange possible for a rabbit. I have the same thing with the turkeys. Now, I shoot a 20 gauge, uh-huh. but I'm trying to shoot number nine, number 10 TSS. Oh, yeah. And just like put as much pellets down range as possible for that turkey. And the cool thing about like a twenty gauge, like the one thing I like about the over and under, my gun's five and a half pounds. Yeah. Like a lot of other you go to like a pump or automatic and a twenty gauge, it can still be, you know, a, a fairly not not as heavy as some of the bigger twelve gauges, but um but yeah, I, I like that that twenty gauge load and getting be able to throw a lot of pellets down range so small pellets. I, well, I I do that a lot of pellets. Uh, because I'm in there with the dogs, and a lot of my shots are close. Uh, but now, sometimes too close. Barry, I tell you, Saturday morning, you know, right before you kill that swamp rabbit, I had that little cottontail run on, literally under my feet. <laughs> Don't shoot your foot I mean, off. like, right, you know, and so it doesn't matter what you're shooting. You're just blowing holes in the ground because it's like shooting a rifle at him. Now, I killed the <laughs> rabbit, but the dogs had to catch him. Uh, you know, the third shot, he had gotten just enough distance that i got a little bit of a spread that's my fault i should have let him run under my feet 
But when you're hunting in a place where you can't see 15 yards, there's not a little, lot of give and take. You know, when you got to shoot, you either got to let him go or shoot. But uh, as far as turkeys, now, like I said, I'm not even going, all three of y'all are better turkey hunters than me. But I've killed turkeys with 410, 28, 20, 16, and 12. And I've never shot at a turkey with 10 gauge. But I, kill, I did when the TSS, uh, TSS shot got popular. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a Browning pump, BPS 410. And just with the uh, screw-in choke that came with it, I shot a number nine into a turkey target at 40 yards. And I was confident. I mean, you know, I said, well, it's it's hitting where it's supposed to hit. And I had, though, some doubts, probably just like Barry did. When you first start hunting with 410, you feel a little bit. Under gun. You're under gun. Oh, yeah. You're a little bit intimidated by it. <laughs> and, uh, but I went down there on that 40 acres, and I called in a bird. And I'm going to say he was 37 yards. I don't think he was quite 40, but he was between 35 and 40. I said, well, we're going to see. And I shot, and that son of a gun just laid down. I mean, he just flopped down on his chest. You know how they do. He just flopped his wings a little bit. And uh, I said, well, boy, I guess they're right about this TSS stuff. Number nine, just out of the factory screw-in choke. Uh, but like I think you told me the other day, Barry, I mean, you, you can get these, uh, you know, more advanced chokes, but sometimes the choke came with your gun, does just fine. I mean, it, uh, I mean you know. Yeah, you I've just got a pattern, and I mean, if it does good, don't mess with it. If it's yeah, I've working, seen, I've seen several guns that like the fact, like my little four ten. You know, I've not experimented with it, but I've seen several several guns. You know, several different guns where the factory choke actually shot better than some of the, you know, some of the aftermarket higher end chokes do. So, or or you get the same about the same amount of pellets. You know, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, it, it, there again, it varies on on guns. Barry, let me ask you this: What gets you excited about turkey hunting? Explain um, it to a listener who maybe. Is this a first year ever turkey hunting? What gets you excited about? Going I think it's the gobble up close gobble to me. You know, uh, uh, the whole experience is. You know, I, you know, I got friends. Man, I'd love to turkey hunt. I'd love to turkey hunt. I'm just scared to be in the woods in the spring. You know, with snakes. It just oh. terrifies me. You know, and you know, and I got past that because I am too. You know, but I mean, but we used, where I'm at, we used to have a lot of rattlesnakes, and you know, and, 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 and man, just seeing a couple of them would break you out in sweats knowing you're walking around with them. But I tell you what, we what happened to us is we got a lot of hogs. And my theory is, since we've got the hogs, I, I don't see those kind of snakes anymore. I'm, and I know we still got some, but I, and my theory is, I think you know, as they come across them, they, they eat them just like they do anything else. So, I don't see the snakes anymore. But, but you know, as uh, far as uh, going back to the question, is is, is the gobble? Um, just you know, trying to outwit the bird. You know, you you know, you you can outwit him one day, then you know, the next day, you know, make it, you'll think you're a pro one day, then the next day, you know, you're 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 back. You know, you're. They, they've got you back to where you're questioned, you know, <laughs> what am I even doing trying to do this, you know? So, I mean, it, 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 it just the whole experience is. But, I'm, you know, for me, the gobble is a close, especially up close gobble. That's the reason I, I said earlier a while ago I probably call too much still. But, man, I just like to hear him gobble, you know. If I, if I, even if I can see him, you know, and he's not gobbling, I still want to make him gobble a lot of times one more time before him. But, you know, just that part of it is, is, is what gets me. Well, now about the snakes. I, I was about it. to say, you ain't afraid of snakes. <laughs> you snake bit big. I'm going to tell you this. If, if two things, if you're afraid of snakes and you're afraid of getting shot, you need to take up golf. <laughs> <laughs> because you're not a woodsman. I oh. mean, really, I, and, and it's not, I'm not going to play with no, no snake. And I'm not going to intimidate him. But, you know, I got to think I've been bit three times by snakes in my life. None of the times. Y'all, you know the times, Andrew. I got yeah, bit. You, you got bit recently. I got bit last summer in my garden. I got bit. Now, he, I had on snake boots. And those downer snake boots saved me. Uh, I'm picking tomatoes, and he bit me. Cotton mouth. And then you know when I got bit, he actually got poison in me. And the other time was copperhead. But you know what? I, I, Alan brought up something I hadn't even thought of. All the years I've spent hunting and fishing, and Barry and Ted, we came hunting in swamps, walked around in swamps, sat down where I know rattlesnakes was. The three times I've been bit was never hunting or fishing. One time was cutting grass, which is what I do, got a lawn service. The other two times working in my garden. Now, in what, 55, 56 years of hunting, Barry? We've been hunting, I don't know, 57 years? Yeah. I've, I've uh, been a bit of you it. would think if I'd been bit three times, it'd be hunting or fishing. 
Now, now, don't get me wrong. I'm not. It's not that I'm not afraid of them or whatever, but it's just like uh, people being afraid to fly. You know, I mean, if it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. If you don't hunt because you're scared of snakes, take up another hobby. It's hard to argue with that. I mean, I just take up, and you liable to get bit on the golf course. <laughs> I mean, really? Hey, uh, pr- probably a higher likelihood to get bit by an alligator too. Do you know the, 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 the top five most dangerous sports hunting is not in them. Fishing's in it, and golf is in it because of lightning strikes. Really? But hunting is, I don't even, you know, of course, now you'd have to look this up, but I know that it wasn't in the top five a couple of years ago, and I don't even think it was in the top ten. If you look up the people that dive hunting, most of it is tree stand Yeah, accident. falling out of tree stands. Falling out of tree stands. It's not gunshots. It's not snake bites. Uh, I mean, me and Barry fished. We fished around alligators and lots of snakes, haven't we? Oh man, you can't, yeah, boy! You just, <laughs> I mean, a lot of, I mean, you know, <laughs> you get any of them in the boat? Of course. Um, closer than we wanted to before. My, actually, my father-in-law was fishing with me one time, and we we were in a, in the back of a slough on the Alabama River, and he he tied on the biggest. Uh, we seen an alligator laying up there, and he tied on the biggest top water plug he had in his box there, you know. And of course, this thing goes out and just chomping this top water, and you know, treble hooks in it, and man, you know, I'm thinking the line's gonna break quick. Well, unfortunately, you know, it didn't. So this thing's wallowing all under the boat. You can feel the boat you know shaking and all so, and it ain't broke the line yet you know so i'm thinking man i got to cut the line or whatever you know of course it finally broke but man it, it was closer and closer than what we wanted him to be and he was madder than what i wanted him to be <laughs> i know i know you got a good story about uh you and colton fishing on was it shades creek one time and y'all got in the boat and there's a copperhead in the boat with you and colton yeah, felt was... something nudging his leg <laughs> no no it, it was uh, literally if colton was here too it, it I'll try to make it quick, but we went down Shays Creek, and I got this boat turned over. You know how you do. Mm-hmm. We uncabled it, you know, and we was real careful rolling it over because, you know, might be a snake under there. Well, unbeknownst to us, the snake, it was early in the spring, and this snake has got gotten up under the seat. You know how the seat runs mm-hmm. across in a John boat. Mm-hmm. And apparently the snake, I guess maybe it was cool that morning, and he was just docile. Well, me and Colton start up the creek, and we caught a couple of bass. It's probably an hour into the float. And I hear Colton, I'm casting, and I hear him go, ooh, a snake. And I look back, and literally there is a copperhead. It's a copperhead. And it's on his leg, and the snake was not upset. It was just looking around like, what's going on? <laughs> and uh, I said, don't move. Why? Oh, I said, I said, why? <laughs> I said, Stay don't still. move, Colton, because what I was afraid of is he'd try to swat it and it'd bite him. And uh, Give me that paddle. <laughs> and when I said don't move, I think Colton just had enough. I mean, he he jumps up, my snake falls in the bottom the boat. And Colton runs up there with me. Well, you know, in a little old John boat, boat wears up. We're both on the front seat. I mean, y'all know this is true because Colton made a bracelet out of the snake. Uh, uh. <laughs> Colton grabs a little. We had a little single shot, twenty gauge. Oh shit! Th- and, he, and the snake <laughs> is just confused on what's going on. And Colton's pointing at the snake, and I said, "Don't shoot a hole in the boat." <laughs> the snake's not really trying to bite us. It's just like don't know what to do. Well, snake goes over the edge and gets in the water, and Col- I said, "Kill it." Well, y'all know Colton's a good shot, but he's so nervous, he misses it twice, just blowing big holes in the water. <laughs> I said, Colton, calm down, just kill the snake. And he killed it. And then he sits down, he's white as a sheep. And, you know, he ain't about 12 years old. And I got Coca Cola's in the cooler for him. I got water and beer. I said, Son, do you need a beer? <laughs> calm down. He said, No, but I'll take a bottle of that water. <laughs> and uh, so when we came back down the creek, the old snake, it's just, you know, uh, it's dead, but it's kind of floating. And he said, I want that snake. And you remember he made a, I don't know if he still got, but he made a bracelet out of it. Yep. And, uh, of course, Andrew taught him how to, Andrew knows how to tan some hides. Yeah, that's back when we were tanning all kinds yeah, of coons and, and, and foxes and deer. And they tanned the hide and Colton wore it. And one time I carried Colton the doctor about something. And this doctor grew up in Coleman. And he just looked at Colton and said, uh, any man that wears a copperhead bracelet's got a story behind it. So when I finish examining you i want to hear the story <laughs> and so we talk you know and this old guy he grew, he grew up coleman you know he was old hunter but he just looked and very calmly said any man wearing a copperhead bracelet 
a story behind it. I said, it sure is. <laughs> Absolutely. So anyway. Uh, well, yeah, that's boy, you grow up in the woods in a lifetime, you have all kind of crazy. Yeah, crap you got, to you. yeah, you got all kinds of good stories. Yeah, y'all uh, got any... Well, yeah, I was just—I want, I want to hear some crazy stories. <laughs> Turkey yeah. hunting or I was not? About say, I was about to say. All right, Barry. Well, I—I need—I need. I need what, what's some crazy, memorable stories from back in the day? Uh, well, we got a gator story. That was—I like that. Yeah, the gator story was 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 a was a uh, a scary story to me. You know, I'd say we got a little closer closer than to him than we wanted to be. Or he got There's a some we probably shouldn't tell on this podcast. <laughs> Get us in trouble. <laughs> we'll leave anyway. those stories out. Yeah, we'll leave those stories. out. Let's see. Um, some of mine would be, uh, you know, just some of the turkey hunting. It wasn't necessarily so young uh, th- that I was young. It was, you know, some of this the past few years. You know, just an old guy I hunt with. He's not. He just turned ninety, and he's still still trying to turkey hunt a good bit. He's just a. Uh, he would just crack you up, you know. Just it's just a little wiry fella. He's, he said, you know, he's one hundred and thirty five pounds, and he can eat. Uh, he can eat a, a whole cake, and you know, and he'd be 136 pounds, you know. So I mean, and be, be back to 135 tomorrow. But man, everything, you know, everything that comes out of his mouth is just, uh, just, a, just, a, just a hooch, you know, just like a uh, me and him food with three turkeys. Uh, it's probably been 10 or 12 years ago. Three different mornings, we food with three different turkeys. So they'd go, we'd go to them, they'd go the other way. Next morning, we'd go where they went that morning. But the morning before, they'd go the other way. So. Uh, uh, he came, he, you know, he, three mornings wasted pretty much is what we've done, you know, because them turkeys wasn't going to mess with us. So he, he finally told me, he said, man, you can't do nothing with homo turkeys. Them's just homos. They don't want to do with a hen. <laughs> they, you know, they want to be together, and if they're just, you know, they're not going to do anything with a hen. So, mm-hmm. so, you know, later on in season, you know, we probably food with them more than they did, but this was early season, and they just didn't want anything to do with us. But like I say, everything that come out of his mouth is just a hoot, you know. He just a uh, just uh, just off the top of his head, he's got you know he's got a joke coming out. So. It, what, what's his name again? His name's Chubby. He called him Chubby Foster. You know he weighs 135 pounds, but his nickname's Chubby. He worked in the coal mines, and he got his nickname Chubby. So it's Chubby. <laughs> Chubby Foster. He lives up in Athens, Alabama, but he hunts with us down south down there, and, and he's he's not able to get along much more, too too well anymore. You know his legs have finally got to him. But he told me at a funeral uh, a few weeks ago. He said, "Man, I just think about what I could do a few years ago." I said, "But I cut him off." I said, "Yeah, but." Listen, you were 85 years old. You were doing a few years ago what most people couldn't do then. So at 90 years old, you're still walking 100 yards. How many 90-year-old men did you know could walk? You know could walk down to the green field at 100 yards and hunt like you're doing now? So I said you were an exception five or six years ago, and you're an exception now. So I hope I'm doing that. At I ask what I tell him. I tell him that all the time. But I had to remind him about that a few weeks ago. <laughs> now was Chubby? Has he always been a turkey hunter? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He's he's had. He's, his family was just you know they they grew up in the in the in the sticks. I call them in the sticks. You know down in Bibb County. But um, you know they they just you know they had to they had to hunt to eat. You know back in the day. So you know just th- those guys are you know just. Um, it was a necessity. To They're hunt. just woodsmen. Yeah, it was, just it was a necessity to, for them to, to, to be able to hunt. You know, their dad gave them three shells, and you better come back with three squirrels mm-hmm. or three rabbits, whatever the case may be. But, yeah, just, you know, just uh, him and his experience over here. He's, he's another one of my mentors. You know, he, he's a... Uh, uh, like I say, he's on up in age, and I feel for him because I know he still wants to do what he thinks he can do, and he can't. But, uh, but yeah, he, he's, he's a great, was a, always a great hunter and still is for his age. Barry, I gotta say this: you gotta help us get him on the podcast. I want him to come tell the story. Oh my, oh my, you would, you would love it. I mean, there, there's not a person I know it that, that that's ever met Chubby Foster it, it, that that ain't got a story for him. I mean, he's he's a, he's a I mean he's an amazing amazing fella. I mean he's he's got. So I reminded Barry of Saturday we're rabbit hunting. They were giving me a hard time because lately I, I mean I'm killing rabbits, but lately I'm shooting a lot of shells to kill a rabbit. Mm. You know what I mean? You uh-huh. get in those. So. So I killed this rabbit and I shot one time. It was kind of funny story because uh, dogs are running, and man, I gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> Which and, one? Oh, I gotta take a crap. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I thought, you know, the dogs kind of were away from me. I thought, well, now's the time. And I said, but as sure as I do, they're gonna be coming over. To, I mean, they're gonna be coming right to me. Well. By the time I'm pulling my britches up, buddy, they, they, they made a lose, what we call, you know, they got quiet. All of a sudden, buddy, they strike, and they're coming straight to me. And here I am, I got my vest laying on the ground, I'm trying to get my britches up, and I said, well, the heck with that, and my gun's leaning against the tree. I'll grab my gun, I'm standing there literally, if you'd have walked up on me, it'd been pretty funny, son. <laughs> and there comes that rabbit, and I mean, he's right, right, 
you know, runs right behind me, and I let him get just far enough, and I killed him in one shot. And uh, because I've been shooting like two and three times, kill one, I come out, and that Eugene said, oh, it couldn't have been you to kill that rabbit because it was only one shot. It couldn't have been you. <laughs> and that's the fun of, you know, small game hunting. You're joking with your buddies. And I reminded Barry of uh, a man named my first experience with bird dogs when I was 14. Oh, y'all hunting. His name was Sam Ham, and he was a big, lanky, tall guy. And like Barry said, he couldn't have. Uh, he he had drunk a beer to keep his britches on his hips. You know what I mean? He was <laughs> oh, one yeah. of them lanky could walk you in the ground. When he was in his seventies, and I was in my twenties, Barry can tell you on with him. He could walk you in the ground when he was in his seventies. But anyway, one time we were down in Bullock County, I guess it was down there. You know where mm -hmm. we was hunting bear. And there was still some quail, and we pointed a covey of quail. And uh, he had a setter named Rip, and I forgot what, which pointer. But anyway, they point, and this big covey of quail gets up, and I kill one, and Sam kills one. And Sam says, I got mine. And I said, I got mine. And he looked at Barry and said, you get your son? And Barry said, I didn't even fire a shot. I mean, evidently, birds, nothing gave him a shot. And Sam said, well, son, if you find a way to kill quail without shooting a shell, let me know because shells are expensive. <laughs> and them old guys just, you know, they're quick on their feet. But I, th I, I have never forgot that, and I reminded Barry the other yeah, day. That's right. I said, that's why they make fun of me about shooting my shell. I said, if I, if I know it's a safe shot and I see that rabbit, I'm going to throw some lead at it. I said, I'm not counting uh, shells, I'm counting rabbits. <laughs> you know, I mean, and that's what Sam used to tell me. He said, son, don't count shells, count quail. You know, he said, shoot. He said, because you're not going to kill them if you don't shoot. You know, and uh, so. Yeah. That's like being on the dove field, man. Uh, when you hear people shooting on a dove field, it's like one shot, they got them, two shots, maybe three shots, he didn't get them. <laughs> <laughs> you hear the four shot, where's the game war? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you hear that yeah, four yeah, shot. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah, man. We got some good stories about dove hunts, too, man. We used to have some <laughs> incredible dove hunts. Yeah. Incredible Andrew, dove hunts. you shoot with us. I don't oh, think yeah. you ever shot down Jim, but I, I had, oh, some, yeah. I had some good shoots down there. Yeah, we had some really good shoots. That really was, good that was shoot. always fun. Yeah. And that was the first place I'd ever seen a bird dog run down a bird. Uh, when you had Trooper. Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I just I remember seeing a bird, you know, like a wounded dove will do. He's like flying like four yeah, feet off the ground. Yeah, kind of bouncing off the ground, but yeah. still flying. And Trooper just going and jumping in the air and grabbing Snatching it out of the out air. Snatching there. Yeah. 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 And I, that was like the coolest thing ever. That was man. a bork and spaniel I had. Oh, that's yeah. it. Yeah. That's, 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 that's a lot of fun, man. No, you know, I, I, there was a lot of birds I would not have found without him. And then the best one I had was a uh, black lab named Paul's. You didn't lose a bird. If it, put it this way, if he didn't come out with a bird, uh, you were mistaken. That bird wasn't on the ground. He didn't miss a bird. I mean, in other words, you know, it could fall in head high stuff. Bird was in there. Uh, one time I doubted him. He, I, I shot a dove and it fell in this thick mess. And, uh, you know, I gave him the command to fetch it. He went in, a little bit he come out and looked at me. I got on to him, sent him back in there. He come out a second time. And the third time, I'm really frustrated with him. And I thought, well, I know where that bird is. I walked in there, and the reason he wasn't bringing that bird out, it was it, it was hung up overhead high in some honeysuckle. Well, he couldn't bring the, but he took me in there and showed me where the bird was. <laughs> and I thought, well, so that, that was another saying Sam Ham used to have. That was a case where the dog was smarter than the hunter. <laughs> And Sam used to tell me, he said, you know why most people can't train a bird dog son? And I said, why? Wow. He said, because the dog's a lot smarter than the man is. <laughs> he said, that's why most people can't train a bird dog. Yeah. He said, you got a bunch of dumb <laughs> out there that don't know what they're doing with a bird dog. You know, he said, if you got a good dog that's in his blood, he said, all you got to do is teach him discipline. The rest comes natural, but you got to control that dog. And he's right. Mm -hmm. you got to control that bird dog, you know. That's been one of the biggest learning lessons we've had with bird dogs, because <clears throat> this is our these are our first bird dogs we've ever had, and we were talking this morning. You know, you always got to trust the hunter with the longest nose, and uh, I don't know how many times I've had instances like that with Boone, where uh, like he like he'll go and and like 
I don't know, throw like a soft point on something or whatever, or he'll just, he'll be trying to tell me something and I'm not really listening to it. And then we go walking through there and then like the bird gets up and you're like, oh man, I'm sorry. Like I <laughs> should have been listening to you. <laughs> I can only imagine what the dog's thinking. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Trust me, man. Trust me. I, I, I well, tell you, that's, uh, well, these beagles, uh, I told Barry, our old dogs, um, I've learned you, you trust them. Now it's true when you run in puppies, it's like Saturday morning. I have one get out of pocket. My old dogs kind of come back, you know, and I had to hit him with a collar, and he rest the rest of the day is fine. But puppies are like little teenagers, you know. Uh, they they want to mess up every now and then, but trust your old dogs. Don't doubt them. I mean, I've had times I wanted to doubt them. I think they run something they ain't supposed to be. But then usually somebody kill a rabbit, and I think, well, I go back to what Sam said. Most time, you know, dog smarter than you are. If it's an old, dependable dog, you don't doubt your dog. If it, you know he, it may not be working out like you think it's supposed to work out, but he's the one who got the nose. You know you don't. I mean, he he knows what's going on. You know so. What were you about to say, Jacob? I was gonna say uh, Pepper when we were running quail today. <clears throat> hunting her for quail later when you didn't make it back out she was disgusted with our shooting capabilities <laughs> 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 then we, we do she put some great points on and go to flush pa 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 and she was like she like go run out where the bird should have landed if we would have killed it and looked back at us like what the heck happened boys what are y'all doing and then like all right back to hunting again and they do it I think we put forty birds out, killed seventeen. Yeah, no, the fourteen. The the part that's bad is uh is like we'll be woodcock hunting around here, and you know like when you're woodcock hunting, you're hunting like thick cover, <clears throat> and I'll be out with Boone. This happened a couple times, a couple weeks ago when it was just me and Boone out, where like he'd point a woodcock and I go up and flush it, and I get I hunt with a side by side, and I get both shots off, don't touch it, kill two saplings or whatever, you know, kill two trees. And, uh, but you know, Boone doesn't know that he's just in the thicket, you know, he can't see anything. And like, he's looking so hard for a dead bird. And I like, can't oh, even, yeah. I can't even get him off of it because he's just looking, he's so fired up. I'm like, oh, yeah. he I'm thinks so, you killed the bird. I mean, <laughs> like, I'm sorry, man. I don't know what to tell you. So y'all put out 40 and kill 17. Y'all should have carried me and Barry this morning. You kill 21. <laughs> Probably, you know, maybe something like, well, I don't know. Yeah. I told Barry, I, I go on them quail hunts. I can get on a roll and kill everyone and shoot at. Then I can get on a roll, I can't hit nothing. Barry's the same thing. Same thing, man. You know, we 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 uh we went up in Athens one time where they put out the birds for us, and I don't know if it might not have been your first time, but I think it was my first time. We we put out a, a male and a female pheasant, and uh, the guy said the guy told us he said now I don't know if y'all have ever shot these things. He said that you know they'll come up and once they get where they want to be, they're gone. So he said if you don't kill them pretty quick. Oh, yeah, they'll fool you. Well, you know, and anyway, we killed, I think we killed the first one, maybe two. Uh, that, but anyway, long story short, we, we had one to get up, and we, we shot all of our shells on him, and that quail, I mean, that pheasant, he, he, he went, went off, next county. Went off the <laughs> properties as far as we could see. He was still still flying. So. Well, they're, they're like a turkey. When they come up, they're struggling. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're trying, especially the rooster. He's vulnerable, and he'll get to a certain point, just like, a, say, a big gobbler getting up. He almost comes to stop. But even that gone turkey, once he begins gliding, he'll deceive you. He's moving a lot faster than you think he is. And that pheasant, uh, old guy told me, he said, many of, he goes to South Dakota, many a rooster that don't have tail feathers, people shoot behind them because when they start gliding, you think they're moving uh, slower than what they really are. Mm. Uh, you know, I've killed some pheasants. but And, yeah, when they're coming up, they're vulnerable. But once they stretch out, you, you can miss one, or I can miss one. Yeah, I know how to miss yeah. one. It was fun. I say it was funny. It really wasn't funny because we paid for the thing anyway. But you know, <laughs> to, to see it going off his property and just follow it, as far as you can see, it was still going. <laughs> yeah, I remember he told us, "said Boys, we ain't gonna get that because we don't have permission to go over where he's at." <laughs> so he's over by Tennessee River somewhere. We don't have permission to be over, there, you know. <laughs> so, get, like getting back onto the turkeys, uh, we were we were talking earlier about. You know, just turkey hunting stuff, and and you mentioned you've killed a slam, right? Like you've killed all the subspecies. I have I um one one year I, I killed I was able to kill them all in one year. You know, I'd I'd killed the Rio and the Merriam and the uh and the Eastern, of course, and I, I actually bid on a hunt at an auction for the kids' outdoors auction, and I I won this hunt up to uh, to Florida to, to hunt the Osceola. 
Well, you know, I was just thinking, I, I can kill this Osceola, and I'll have my slam because I've already killed the other ones. Well, my buddy said, hey, he said, you know, you can kill it. You're going to kill the Eastern here if you can kill that one there. Then you go into Nebraska if you can kill a Merriam and a Rio up there, which, is, you know, is pretty common to do. He said, you can kill a Grand Slam all in one year, which I never thought about that. So I was able to do that that one year. I was able to kill all four in one year up there. But, you know, I'd love to go to, to Mexico and kill the other two, but I haven't done it yet. But. But those, you know, able, able to kill that slam in one year was really, really a lot, meant a lot to me. <laughs> what, what, what was that like? What, what, you know, hunting Easterns in Alabama your whole life and, and just being here your whole life, what was it like, you know, what were the differences like between all the different turkeys? Uh, not to me, the Osceola wasn't a whole lot of difference. Just a different kind of land, you know, the part of Florida they're in down there, the, you know, the area of Florida. They're, of course, they're not a whole, whole state of Florida. The, the area they're in there, you know, I, I talked to the guy down there that, that, uh, that, that, um, that gave the hunt away that we bid on. And, he, and I asked him, I said, what, what makes this turkey Osceola just say, hey, I'm tired of this sand. I want to go toward Alabama, you know. He said, you know, they're just sand hill turkeys. That's, you know, that's that's where they migrate. They, you know, they don't want to leave here. And that's, that's the reason, you know, the reason the Osceola hunts are so high because, you know, they're just in one particular area. And those guys can charge you what you want, you know, because they don't migrate far. But, but you know, just uh uh, that experience, but I don't. I don't think he was a whole lot of difference to me than it was Alabama, other than the terrain. You know, a lot of palmettos, a lot of sand. Uh, after the podcast, I'll show you a few pictures I got. It's like turkeys like laying on the beach. You know, the sand is where he's laid out there on. But, but you know, the uh, you know Kansas, South Dakota, uh, uh, Nebraska, Texas, all those Rios, Can uh, Oklahoma. We went to Oklahoma. All those are you know Rio states. Man, they're they're just. It's just, they're just a wild, wild, wide open turkey. You know, they're, you know, you don't take a, don't take a lot of calling. We were out in Kansas, for example, a couple, the first time we went, and, you know, I carried my box call, didn't know what to expect. The wind's blowing, you know, out there 100 miles an hour. The trees grow crooked, you know, the wind blows them to, out of the west, so they grow, you know, they grow crooked. So the guy just happened to be with me on up in the morning, and I took out my box call and started whacking it like I do here. And he looked around at me and said, man, what are you doing? I said, I thought, he said, I'm, I'm trying to get one to go with that box. He said, man, you got to get on this box. So he took it from me, and he was whacking this thing, you know, and it's, I mean, <laughs> he said, they can't hear it unless you're in that wind. He said, you ain't, you know, they, they don't care. You, you can't call too much to them. You, you know, they don't care how much you call to them, and you got to be loud. So uh, once I got the hang of that, you know, I started picking up the, you know, the, the, the uh, what the what the Rios wanted out there, but you know, like Nebraska, we go up there, man. It's almost too easy. It's like almost like, you know, kill them out of a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> the guys up there I'm hunting with, they're they're doing, a, you know, people call it fanning, but you know, we're, he's taking a full decoy up there with a GoPro camera on it, and so you know, when the turkey ninety ninety percent of the time when they see that decoy up there, they are coming to it. Don't matter if it's three hundred yards away or whatever. If they, if they see it, they just about gonna come to it where we're hunting up there mm -hmm. and you know and we, we're doing the gopro so you can get the whole footage of the you know of him of him breaking and coming and so it's it's a, it's a lot of fun but just you know uh, easterns if you can hunt if you can kill an eastern turkey you can kill any of the others that's for sure yeah that that's that's a that's why i hear a lot man we we hunted rios one time and jacob missed like a whole bunch of them in like <laughs> one day i was telling you about that earlier three but, in yeah, one morning three before noon so that, was, that was really <laughs> on 160 acres too. Well, if it don't make you feel bad, now I, I got paired up with a guy in Nebraska one time because it was kind of an odd number, and he, I didn't know him, but he was from Illinois. Well, the day before, you know, we we, uh, we you know we we just had a, like a round table discussion, everybody, you know, just carrying on, and, and I, you know, I'm thinking, man, this guy's a for real turkey hunter, you know. So first day, seven turkeys, he missed seven turkeys the first day before he killed one the second day. Seven, <sighs> seven, seven gobblers the first day. Now, missed. what distance was these birds? Huh? What distance was he burned? Oh, uh, 20 yards, 25. I, I, <laughs> hey, I, I don't know how you miss a bird like that. I mean, honestly, I've never missed seven a bird. Seven times like that. in a row. Seven. I missed seven the first. Well, he grew up at one. Now, we, 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 you know, I thought he'd killed it, and we looked hard for it. We never did find it. But, I mean, he drew feathers on that one, but I can't say he drew feathers on, on. the next. I'd limited out the first day, so I didn't get to hunt with him the second day. But I, I, I asked the guy after I left, I said, hey, did that guy ever kill a turkey? He said, yeah, it was the second day, midday of the second day before he finally killed one. <laughs> yeah. That's brutal. Next time I'm feeling down about my shooting, I'll think about that. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I mean, he was sitting side by side with me one time. I'll, I'll show you later, too. I killed a five-beard turkey with him up there, but there was four of them coming. I was fixing to shoot the middle turkey, and uh, I just happened to look to the right. They done got so close. I happened to look to the right, and the way, way he was standing, I could tell he had multiple beards. So I, I pulled and shot him. He ended up hit with a five-beard turkey, the only one I've ever killed a five-beard turkey. But... But he missed. Now that's one. He he did shoot. That's one one of the ones he crippled. Uh, that one out of that, out of that bunch there. But now, see, I think 
was talking about getting your head down on the gun. Mm -hmm. And I can easily see how you can miss a turkey if your head's up too high. But where I've struggled with that is shooting at quail. My head's up too high. Mm -hmm. That has been a problem for me. But when I'm hunting a turkey, I never do. I mean, I guess because I'm thinking, you know, I see the bird coming or I, or I know he's about to step out. So I make a conscious effort that my cheek's down on the gun. But I told Barry, I was up there hunting with Ted, where we was talking about, uh, we used to quail hunt up there. And I, was, I got on one of them bad streaks, I couldn't hit a quail. And just like a golf pro watches you swing a golf club, Ted said, Ben, I know you can hit birds. He said, I don't want to make you mad, but I'm going to tell you what you're doing wrong. I said, no, you're not going to make me mad because I'm mad with myself. He said, you're not getting your head down on that gun. You cheat well, what I call it, is not getting down on the gun. So we point right after that, and he said, no, I, won't, I expect you to kill this bird because I've told you what you've done wrong. First of all, I'm thinking, don't put that kind of pressure on me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, yeah, I killed the bird. But now with a turkey, I hadn't had that problem, I guess, because, I mean, you know, it's not like a quail getting up or a rabbit getting up and you just accidentally not. You know, I, I'm thinking in my mind, now, i got to get down on this gun. In other words, it's in my head. But I can see where you get excited and not do it. But usually uh, it's running through my head now. I think of it like you're laying on a railroad track looking down them cross eye. Get that head down, you know. So uh, I did, uh, I guess three years ago, me and Alan were up there. And Alan, I told you, he, he worked on this bird all morning. And, man, there is no telling how many times that bird gobbled. And I'm 200 yards or 250 down the field. And I'm just listening to Alan work with him. This was a big old bird, and he was smart, and he just was not going to come out in that field. And he finally circles into what I call my big field, and he gets behind me, and I thought, well, now he's fair game now. I'm going to start working on him. But, I mean, this is like from 7 in the morning to 10 in the morning. I mean, it's like it's done got ridiculous, you know. I mean, just to the point you're either like, I want him to stop gobbling or let's kill him. I mean, he, he was uh, – so what I did, I started doing, Alan was just hitting a box call, yelping. I started cutting. And I'm cutting and doing all kind of crazy stuff, and then I just shut up. And I had him double gobbling. And I called Alan, I said, don't say another word, I'm not saying another word. I said, I'm going to drive him, because I'm, I'm at the point, got to do something. I just, I just quit, I wouldn't say a word. He gobbled some more times, and he got quiet. Then the whole world's quiet. And I waited and waited and waited. What we call a gap where you come out of our big field into our, well, they're both big fields, but you know how it is up there with all the corn. But I see him ease out in that gap. Boy, he's looking, looking, looking. Well, I thought I wasn't going to be nervous, but I got nervous because after all that time, you know, there he is. And boy, he was up there. I mean, you kill a 25-pound bird. I mean, you know, I don't even know if I've ever seen a 25 pound bird in Alabama. Mm -hmm. But it's this, uh, but I bet, but I mean, they kill 25 pound birds up there. I've never killed one, but I believe this one was. And uh, and those cornfields, I got too, I got too excited, I guess, and uh, I misjudged the distance. And I shot, and uh, I almost saw my shot hit. It was, it was just a lot further than I thought. He picks up and starts flying down the middle of the field, and I thought Alan was still down there where he was. But he had gotten down and crawled and going to try to ambush him in that other field. And I'm yelling at Alan, kill the bird, kill the bird. I thought it was going to fly right over him. It wasn't that high. Well, old bird just goes over on the next farm. He just, like Barry talking about that pheasant, he just disappears over on the next farm. And we spent all morning working on that bird and still didn't get him. But it was fun. <laughs> I mean, man, Alan had him working. I, I sat there all morning listening to Alan working him. But that bird, I mean, he would get right up behind Alan's blind. But he wouldn't come out in that cornfield. He knew he knew not to step out there. And I finally, I told Alan, I said, well, you might want to just crawl out back of the blind, crawl on your belly, and just see if you can ambush him. Uh, I mean, at some point, it just gets, 
it's driving you up a wall, you know. So, but I guess that's what's fun about turkey hunting. It is. You know, it is. I've done the same thing a few years ago. I had <clears throat> I had a friend of mine at turkey hunting with me, and he he was having a little bit of a rough season. I'd already killed a few. Well, I got a little lease over in Brookwood, Alabama. This uh, friend of mine got and he lets me turkey hunt on. And, uh, and we went over there. Uh, it was on Good Friday actually, and we went over there. And I I told him I said, "You shoot now. If we get on one, you, you just you know plan on shooting." So we get on one at daylight. I mean, we he's gobbling in the tree, so we we get to him, hear him fly down, or hear them fly down. It ended up being hear them fly down. So that was part of the problem. So we get over there, and you know, 6:30, we're on this bird. He's already flew down. Got three hens with him. We could see this turkey from 6:30 till. It was 12:20 when he killed him. We could see this guy over the whole time, and and he had three hens, and the hens would work toward us every now and then, but then they'd work back toward him. Well, he he wouldn't stay. He was stay in about a 15 yard little strip right there, and, and I, he wasn't he wasn't budging. I mean, we we tried everything. We done all kind of calls. I, I kind of slipped away and went went away a little bit, like I was leaving to see if that you know he that, if that would affect him at all, and it didn't. Well, I finally told my buddy. I said, look, you know this could go on till dark. You know I don't know. If, you know so we we, we got to do something so there was a little bitty knoll between us and him he was about he was he was probably 60 yards you know some people would have shot we just chose not to but uh, we wanted a little, little bit closer but anyway there was a little bitty knoll between us and him i told him finally i said look i said i'm good with you just belly crawling if we spook him we spook him you know it's not you know not you know it's getting late. So anyway, he did. He, he starts crawling. I said, if you can get to that knoll, you're going to cut that 20 yards off we need to be. You're going to be at 40 or less, you know. So the um, only thing I was worried about were the hens, where they were varying, they were going to see him. I wasn't so much worried about the god where he was standing as I was the hens. But anyway, he gets to that knoll, and I see him, you know, get down on his gun. So so he, he shoots him. But, you know, this is, this is you know, a, a six-hour six hour hunt on this turkey, and we can see him the whole time, you know. So, you know, it, just, it can be long. <laughs> it happens quick and it happens so, I mean, it, may, it may go on for a while see that's rough you gotta take a leak and you're like well oh yeah i can see him he could probably definitely see me for sure and now like i gotta take a leak well he has a doctor's appointment this morning that, that morning at 11 o'clock you know so we've already I mean, i'm texting him he's up in front of me you know and so i'm texting him what about your doctor's appointment i said you want to just try to slip out of here no, I didn't text my wife and told her to cancel my doctor's appointment. We can't, we can't. So, you know, so, so this goes like I say at twelve twenty, he pulls the trigger, and we're you know we're 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 already at that bird at six thirty or maybe even a little before six thirty, and he's he's down on the ground. So, yeah, those are some of my favorite turkeys though. Those all day, oh, just yeah. cat yeah. and mouse. It is. And I think that's one of the things I like about turkey hunting because I like it in the same way that I like squirrel hunting where. It's almost like you're a kid and you're just like out in the wood. It's like the woods is your playground and you're just you get to crawl around out there and you know, you know, get hide behind this tree and you're just playing cat and mouse with this with this animal. And it's it's just I don't know, that's part of the allure of it for me, especially after our deer season is like six months long or whatever. So, I mean, we get to deer hunt for a long time. And after sitting in a deer stand for so long and, and hunting like that, you know, because we usually start hunting in September for deer we'll go to georgia or something or some or wherever and then we're hunting till february now uh so like after so long in a deer hunt and being able to go out to turkey hunt and just again doing the cat and mouse and the rabbit hunting too like in february and getting the dogs out or quail hunting or woodcock or snipe or just whatever whatever it is uh it's always nice to just get out and again have that cat and mouse interaction with an animal it's just you and him and you're like you're hunting him like a cat, like you were talking about earlier. You're yeah. like, you got to creep around and like match wits with him. And yeah. like, it's just rewarding. Yeah. This particular turkey, like I say, it was, it was a lot of fun. You know, as it, as it turned out, it was a lot of fun. It was kind of getting nerve wracking, but it was still a lot of fun. You know, just, um, the, you know, the turkey was gobbling as good at 1220 as he was off the roost. You know, he gobbled the whole time. You know, we could mm. make him gobble good. He gobble on his own. He was strutting good, but he, he was not leave about that 15 yard circle. He just rounding around. You know, I thought several times we'd make those hens mad enough, and they, you know, they'd come toward us some, and I kept thinking, you know, if they, if they break and come to us, surely he's coming. Well, he never would. They'd, they'd get, they would get within 25 or 30 yards at, at a couple of times, but he just would not. He would, he would stay there. Every now and then there was a little small stump there. He'd, he'd jump up on that stump and kind of look around, and see if we could look further down there, and he'd have been full strut standing on that stump, but he just had no intentions of coming to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, now talking about you know back to turkeys but you know alan that hunts with me uh, uh his his love is wing shooting squirrels rabbit he really loves the rabbit but squirrels and rabbits probably but also turkey 
Now, he deer hunts with me, and we got that place in Kentucky. But he said one week a year of deer hunting is plenty for him. You know, get after it. And, of course, Barry knows you You go to Kentucky, a place like Kentucky, if the rut's on, a week should be all you need if, you, if you're any kind of hunter. I mean, just not that it's easy, but you're going to get a chance if the rut's on. I mean, you, you, you're going to get a chance at about. But we went up there last year, and uh, things didn't turn out good for me at all. The first night we ate at some uh, hole-in-the-wall Mexican restaurant, and I got food poisoning. I mean, as soon as we got there. You know, we were going to get up at 4.30 or whatever, and I wake up at 2 o'clock, and, boy, I'm I'm so sick. I'm just, you know, dying. But I went on and turkey hunting. And the minute I got out of the truck, I had four birds gobbling. I slammed the door. Now, I didn't think I slammed it that hard and birds started gobbling. That's just the difference in Alabama here, you know. And I hear birds gobbling over there by Allen. So... I, I'm trying to work on birds, but I feel so bad. I'm just not into it. Yeah, but me and Alan had a bird goblin between us. And uh, finally, the bird, all the birds, neither one of us got a shot. He was working on birds. I was. We just It didn't work out. We got a shot. And, man, I was so weak from throwing up. and I mean, I was just sick, sick. And I told him, I said, I'm going to start walking towards you. I said, that bird that was between us is still there, but he shut up. I said, I'm going to start slowly walking towards you. And you start just slowly moving towards me. And, of course, we're safe. We're not going to shoot each other. And I said, maybe, you know, one out of a hundred chances or I thought, you know, whatever. One of us will uh, spook that bird and made a fly. You know, it was just my, I knew I'm I'm done, you know. So anyway, sure enough, I get about halfway to him and I hear him shoot. And uh, he called me and said, I killed that bird. And uh, he he's slipping down this log road towards me. And that bird we had heard goblin, he sees that big old head stick up. And instead of flying, it just tried to run. You know how they do. And he shot and killed it. Well, I was tickled for him, but I told him, I said, carry me back to the hotel room. I spent the next two days in bed watching old movies and stuff, running back and forth to the bathroom. And I can promise you one thing. I can tell you a Mexican restaurant you don't need to go to in Smith, <laughs> Smith's Grove, Kentucky. Because, boy, I was sick. And the amazing thing is, me and Alan both said they had covered that food with salt so heavy. And I think they'd done it because they knew the meat was bad. But Alan didn't get sick. <laughs> but, man, my hunt was ruined. I mean, I, I hunted that morning. That was it. But just talking about how things work out, you know, I just said let's slip towards each other. And maybe somehow we'll just get lucky and ambush him. Well, he killed him. So you just never know about a turkey. That's the most unpredictable kind of hunting in the world to me. It is, you know. They, they you know, something I always say something with a brain the size of a black eyed pea. You know, it can be it can be so smart, can, but can be so dumb. You know, uh, I don't think they know what they're doing a lot of times. So it's hard for you to know what they're doing when they don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, I, I heard someone. It might have been someone we interviewed one time uh, said something along the lines of like, "You got to get good at predicting." where they're going to go when they don't even know where they're going or something like that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Exactly. 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 And I'm like, that seems like a pretty good way to put it. Yeah. Um, but getting to a point of wrapping up here, I wanted to ask both of you guys, um, just if you had advice for maybe someone who's trying to get better at turkey hunting or who's like just getting into turkey hunting this year, well, what, what would you tell them? Uh, Barry, we'll start with you. Uh, just, you know, be, uh, patience. You know, I think you got to be, uh, turkey hunt's a patience game. You know, I think, you, you know, you don't want to try to rush things. You know, uh, uh, learn as you go. Uh, don't don't overcall. Um, take, you know, take advice from as many novice people as you can. You know, uh, be around turkey hunters as much as you can. Like the NWT off show y'all were at, you know, you can, you, a lot of those guys will share enough information with you to, you know, to get to get you. You know, they're not, they're not going to tell you too much, you know, even though you're not hunting in the same state or whatever. It's just a, you know, just a, 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 a turkey thing, you know, just, like, but, you know, just being around people that uh, that can share information with you and, and you know, and you taking that advice and, and using it. And, 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 of course, you know, you got to apply it in the woods, you know, just, you know, uh, don't don't be too aggressive calling is one thing I'd say, and 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 just you know learn from your mistakes. You are gonna make mistakes, and just learn from them. You know, just 
don't ever think you, you know too much about it. Just, you know, because you're going to learn. They're going to educate you every time you go. I don't care how old you are and how many turkeys you've killed. You're going to learn. You know, you're going to have a different experience every time. Every turkey's going to be a little bit different. So just, you know, take all that and, and learn from it. You know, mm -hmm. your mistakes, especially take your mistakes and learn from it. I'll add to that, too. Like you just mentioned the NWTF convention that we came back from. Uh, so many of those call makers up there are just like we were in the booth with Houndstooth uh, one day. Houndstooth Game Calls. Our buddy Lyle Gilbert wow. owns it. Lyle, you know Lyle? Oh, yeah, I know. Okay, so yeah. he, dude, I can't tell you how much time he was spending just talking to people. And, I mean, you know how busy that show is. And, yeah, he, like, every person that stops at the booth, he's taking time. If they're asking questions, he's answering them. And uh, and because we, ha I wanted to bring that up because we have people who will write into the show who maybe they didn't grow up hunting or – uh, they're trying to get into it or, or whatever the case may be, and they don't know anybody. And they're like, well, how do I like go find these mentors? Because, you know, not everyone grows up with a Ben George or anything like that. Uh, so how do I go and, and meet other people who I – and like the NWTF convention, perfect example, or an NWTF banquet or a Turkeys for Tomorrow event or something like that. Like the, the, those are the places to like go and start – just bumping elbows with people and, and start meeting people. And would you agree? Sure, I think so. I think, you know, those guys are, you know, most of those guys are, you know, that's what they do. That's, you know, that's their life. That's, you know, they eat, sleep, and, you know, I'm sure they deer hunt and other things, but, you know, the, the turkey, the turkey, is is their life you know that's what they eat sleep and breathe is turkey so I, you know i think as much as much as you can be around those kind of people and like you say law you know those kind of people like law and them they don't mind sharing the information with you you know they're they're, tr they're trying to sell their cause and stuff you know but you know those guys are educated enough to man they, they can give you the advice you need you know then you just take that advice and apply it to the woods you know as you go to the woods and apply it and if you make mistakes then you learn from that as well but you still want to apply what those novice guys are telling you mm -hmm. it, barry i'll say this it probably helps as well you get one of those banquets or something you're trying to get a mentor uh, someone interested in maybe kind of working with you always helps if you have some property that's got turkeys on it. Well, yeah, if you got, if you got, if you, if you got turkeys, if you got property that's got turkeys, you got friends, I promise you. <laughs> and you got novice friends that, 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 that'll, that'll, because, uh, you know, like I say, the guy, of course, he's not a, you know, he's not an NWTF guy, but the guy that, novice guy that showed me. But, you know, with with me having property and, and him not having a lot of property, but he's got the lot of knowledge, so we mixed that together. I got the property, he got the knowledge, and so I was able to learn from, from that you know you know not saying he he just used me to hunt my property because he didn't because because uh, there was many summers we sat at his house in his carport you know and blowing blowing calls you know the after season that that, uh, that he didn't have to do that with me with mm -hmm. and, t and teaching me you know doing things so yeah man that, that's that's good advice especially hey look if you got like a deer lease with a bunch of turkeys on it you're right you got friends <laughs> you got friends you might not know you got friends but you got friends yeah <laughs> that's right that's right uh ben what about you uh when it comes to like if you were going to give someone advice on turkey hunting what would it be on turkey hunting well I, i've already told you barry's a far better turkey hunter than me but i've done okay but uh probably just like deer hunting i think it's way overthought way overthought i think you put pressure on yourself if you don't hunt comfortable i don't care if you're hunting deer squirrels whatever if you're putting pressure on yourself you you're more likely to fail than you are to succeed but you know how i use squirrels as a way to find deer like hunting squirrels but i'm also paying attention to turkeys like when i had that cabin down on sipsy river when I was squirrel hunting, me and I on squirrel hunting, we weren't the only squirrel hunting. But we're watching what everything's doing. We're watching what the turkeys are doing, what the deer are doing. It's a learning experience. And even if you have a bad morning squirrel hunting, you, you've you've learned, usually always you've learned something. Wouldn't you agree, Barry? I mean, you've, you've learned something. You know, you're seeing turkeys, even in the fall. I told Barry the other day, I have seen turkeys in November down on Sixty River, I'm talking about blown up, full blown, trying to breed hens. For whatever reason, I don't know, because I don't think the hens were receptive. But I guess the bottom line is time spent in the woods. And the way I apply that, just like I apply the uh, deer hunting to what I've learned from squirrel hunting, if I go into the spring and I know a piece of property, I may do it different. I'm not a ridge runner. I'm not going to run. I know people literally just get in their car or truck, whatever, on UTV. When they stop that thing, they call. They run the next region call. But you won't ever see me do that. 
I'm going to go where I know turkeys, because turkeys got a range just like anything, and they got a pattern. And I'm not, uh, once again, I'm not going to tell them I'm a good turkey hunter, but I'm going to do what I do deer hunting. If I know that buck's there, if I know there's a few gobblers hanging out there, I'm going to get where I think they're hanging. And I'm the kind of guy that's going to sit in that one spot, and I'm going to occasionally call. Like very, I, I'm, I try to be moderate with it, but now some days you got to be a little more aggressive. I just put myself in the area I think the turkeys are, and I take my chances. Now, I'm not knocking the ridge runners. A lot of them are really good at it, and you cover a lot of ground. But I know my weaknesses, and that, uh, and I know my strong points. I'm going to get, I carried, uh, you don't know him, but you'd really enjoy talking to him. I've taken kind of a young guy under my wing. He rabbit hunted with Tate. He's a nice guy, isn't he? I showed him where four go- where I know four gobblers are over on management, and they're long beards. The other day, I said, if I was you, I'd hunt this area right here. I said, they were all together in the fall, and I know they're going to separate. I said, but they ain't going far. But I said, I'd hunt my ass off in this area. But that goes back to the squirrel hunting, the deer hunting. So I might approach it a little different than Barry, but that don't mean his way is wrong, my way is right. It's just you you got to hunt in the way that you feel comfortable with. That's the only advice I give to people. I mean, if you, you know, you go to a property you don't know nothing about, you just got to do the best you can do. But that's like in Kentucky. I told Alan this year, I said, we're going to go up there before turkey season. We're going to put up two blinds, one place we call the corner and one place we call the walnut grove. And I would I would almost bet you that one or both of us will kill a gobbler there just because having hunted there for a few years, we're trying to call them out in that cornfield, and them old birds, they're wanting to stay in that walnut grove, and they're wanting to stay in that corner. They'll walk back and forth and talk to us. But I'm going to mess them up this year. I'm going to be sitting there when they do it, walking back and forth. I'm going to be there with them. You know, I told Alan, so we're messing up trying to make them come out in this corn. Now, sometimes they'll run out in the cornfield. But I said, this year, we're going to get in the walnut grove in the corner, and the opening morning, we're going to be sitting there. I said, I wouldn't be surprised both of, them be by, both of us be by the cabin in just a little while. Because I know you got the river there, you're on the high ridge, and gobblers love a ridge. And so maybe I'm wrong. But, you know, and Alan said, well, I'm going to follow what you say. I said, well, we can flip for which one's going to be in which place. But one of us is going gonna to surprise him. He ain't going to do all that walking back and forth, us begging him to come out in the cornfield. I said, we're going we're gonna to knock him to the ground. So that's my plan this year. i got a plan for him. That's the way I go about it. Just, just you know, I pay attention when I'm deer hunting and squirrel hunting. I'm listening to turkey. I mean, you know, you hear them yapping. You, but if you know where the hens are, you know where the flocks are, you, you know, you just get where they are and hunt, time spent. So that's my only advice. You know, I don't know. Is it? Well, Ben, one thing that you mentioned that's like kind of goes back to the whole woodsmanship aspect is after experience hunting an area, it seems like the turkeys kind of do the same thing in certain areas, like run certain ridges, staying in certain hollers, like just certain areas. It's like after you have a little bit of experience, even in a season, like you notice you hunt three days in a row and this gobbler or a, or a gobbler keeps wanting to go to a ridge point or a certain spot. If you can beat him to it that morning and be set up where he wants to be anyways – it won't take a whole bunch of convincing, calling wise, to get him in your lap to be able to get a shot opportunity, I which think, kind of goes I back think, to woodsmanship. I think that's huge, Jerry. You know, if you, if you got, especially if you know where turkeys, you know, where turkeys wanting to be or wanting to go, if you can cut him off, you know, be where he's wanting to be. You know, that's that's part of part of it. A lot of times, you know, like I told you earlier, you know, we were going, we were trying to go where where three turkeys was was gobbling, you know, different mornings, you know, and they'd go the other way, of course, you know. But but if you got a consistent turkey going to a certain ridge, you know. Uh, he's going there for a reason, you know. So if you, mm, that's if you right. Be, if you that's can right. Be, if you yeah. can be set up at daylight on that ridge and know he's coming, you know you're in his house. He's coming there, you know, pretty pretty regular. Um, uh, you know, to me that's just as as huge as anything is set up. You know, that's that's what you know considered set up. So you're setting up on the right ridge, you know, where that turkey's wanting to be. You're, you're you know you're you're cutting cutting the distance off on him, and you're but you're you're where he's wanting to come. Yeah, and that's one thing. I, that's one thing I guess I really put together last year is. 
almost like letting the morning play out a little bit to figure out where the turkeys are at and where they're trying to go. And then either trying to like make a move on them, like where they're trying to go and just set up there and don't make a sound until you're in that position. And, uh, or like what, you, you know, what you guys are talking about where, you know, maybe you, 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 you keep messing up on the, not messing up, but you keep like missing opportunities at the bird. Like he, he's trying to go to a certain area and you can't call him off that point. Well, I know the next day, next morning, I'm going to get to that spot before he ever gets there. It's, and be ready for them. It's the same way with the strut zone. You know, if you know where a turkey's strutting daily at, you know that later in the season, especially, you know, they'll, you know, when the hens start leading them, they gon they gon a lot of times go to the same area and strut. You know, the same. You know, you can tell by the tracks. You can see their drag marks on their wings, so you know where they're strutting at. Or, or certain, you know, just say a greenfield. Some turkeys like to go to the greenfield. You know, at daily and at a certain time daily and stay stay all day. You know, they can see good. Uh, they feel safe because they can see. You know, if, if you you know if you if you can pattern where that turkey's trying to be in a certain greenfield or whatever, of course that's where you want to be you know at some point you want to be set up there he might not go in there till midday till dark you know but you know it uh, uh he just feels comfortable that's that's where he wants to be and you know and he, he's that's his daily routine a lot of times and same is true the buck i killed i told you i saw over there i had that same feeling about him he had he had that spot i wouldn't run the camera and there was guys hunting all around there but they wasn't hunting that spot and um uh, I just had that feeling. I mean, you know, I said, this deer, and I was just reading visibly, reading the sign. Not with a camera, but just doing it the old way, like me and you talk about, Barry. And uh, and I, that wasn't no guarantee I was going to see him or kill him. But I, just, I said, I just had that feeling. I said, just like a gobbler, that's where he wants to be every day. And sure enough, you know, I saw him that morning, killed him that afternoon. Um, that stuff, it really can't be talk you you have to learn it over years and it don't always work i mean but uh anyway you know i i know y'all trying to wrap it up i'll give you a quick example of a and this is several years ago i had i knew there was three gobblers uh, even uh, even in mid season they were still together they were they were together early season or mid season but they were going to this greenfield every day you know and and uh um even if I set up on it, they would get to that back of that field somehow or another before before they got around me. They could get around me and anyway. They get, when, once they got in that field, it would stick around that you couldn't move, you couldn't make a move on them. They'd see you. So this friend of mine, we went down there. Well, uh, we were down there hunting. And I told him, I said, let's do something different. I said, these turkeys, they go to this field every morning. They stay all day and they roost and right off of it. You know, they they're there all day and they when when it's time to fly up, they're flying up off. So we get we go over there one evening about two p.m. two o'clock in the afternoon. And sure enough, we ease up there, and I said, they're they're in the back of that field strutting. And there's a few hens with them. Well, all of a sudden, you know, they're they're too far from us. We can't even get to the edge of the field to get set up. So all of a sudden, man, they they just get in a the fight. They start fighting, and man, it's the awfulest awfulest noise you ever heard. They're pecking each other. Well, they run up out of the field, up into some cut pines. Well, the hens done already left. I told him, I said, let's let's run to the field right fast and get to the edge of the field. So they was happened to be a big old tree there beside the field. So we we sat down beside that field. Man, we started calling to them, and after I mean, right after they went, went away, we got set up. Man, all three of them started gobbling. Here they come. They come back in the field, and they come side by side all the way up to us. And you know, it's one of them one, two, three shoot. We both we killed a double out of those three. But, <laughs> but mm -hmm. you know, just knowing that, just knowing they were in that field, you know, and and the way they would the way they would go, they were safe because you couldn't get around. You couldn't make a move on them. It would stick all the way around them. So so once they got to, and they'd stay in the back of that field all day long. So you know, they just felt safe there. But had they, had they not have gotten that little tussle there, fight with each other, and run off in the woods, we wouldn't have never been, been able to get there. But it just it just happened quick, and we were able to get to the field. And and uh, then as soon as we started calling to them, they come running, and they they come all three side by side straight to the barrel. You know, so that's awesome. That's awesome. Sometimes you got to do unconventional things on deer or turkey. You you got to do you know I think too many people watch too much TV, TV hunting, but you know. Uh, Andrew can tell you, I've, I've done some pretty unconventional things, like lay, laying a ditch because there wasn't a tree to climb. They wasn't, I couldn't get hit, and I just set a stool in a little ditch where I was like, literally my eyes was level with the ground and hunt a place and kill a deer out of it just sitting in a ditch on a little old child's chair, which I ain't tall enough, you know, I don't sit up very high anyway. <laughs> so, you know, just, uh, and on that management area, I get tickled these guys. Uh, over there, well, I, I don't really want to say the place, <laughs> nope, nope. but over there on one particular spot, it's just, man, you go over on one of them gun hunts, be five and literally five vehicles sitting there, and I, 
I was over there and saw two guys literally hunting the same spot. One, they were about 200 yards apart. But they're they're watching the same spot. Um, and I mean, they can just see it, and they're just sitting out in the open on a chair. <laughs> and what it is, they got cameras all around there, and they're getting this buck. I know the bucket is. They're getting him on video, and they're they're about a half mile away from where you kill him. But next year, I'm going to hunt that buck, and I hope I'll be back on this podcast and show you a picture of him. <laughs> they're hunting him in the spot that he is at night. Mm-hmm. And I saw him over there rabbit hunting. And uh, it's a place where there's a little rough, swampy area that borders some pines. And if somebody hunts that buck right there, they'll kill him. But they're over there hunting him. They got cameras set up all over this open place. And literally, Randy Forster and Jay, uh, he went over there one day and Man, there's a Jeep, my truck, and a car, and everybody. And they literally holding hands over there trying to kill this buck. <laughs> and I thought, man, y'all y'all in the area, but you ain't where you're going to kill. I mean, they, I mean, who knows? They might if a hot doe comes across there. But I got him targeted. And he's an eight point, and he's a good eight. I've been 20 yards from him rabbit hunting twice. He'd be sneaking out with my dogs. He's coming in that place where they're at, but they, I, they're not likely to catch him here in daytime. But I, I plan on, I hope I'm on this podcast next year and show you a picture of it. We'll have to do that. <laughs> if, I, if I'm not, I'm going to put somebody else on him. I don't mind helping. I told Tate, I said, I'll, 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 I'll help you out over here. I don't mind. I told Barry, I said, I'll. But you, you, these guys know that management, and they tell you they're good bucks there. Mm-hmm. Don't go over there thinking you're going to see a bunch of deer. You're looking for one. You ain't looking for. Ain't you ain't, if you want to see a bunch of deer, go Sumter County or somewhere. Yeah, you got to go over there with that mentality. Man, mentality, you know that you're yeah. looking, for, looking for a good buck. You know, not not necessarily numbers, but good buck. You know, or. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean that's. Uh, I carry Randy Forster over, and he he killed a buck on place. I put him. I put Allen over, and he saw a good one. But you know how I many he had to sit six times to see him. I put him on deer over there, uh, but Alan had to hunt six mornings, but he did see him. But, uh, uh, you know, he, he didn't get a shot, but that buck's dead. So yep. oh, yeah, I, don't doubt I told Andrew, you remember I told you a place over there that's so literally right off the road? I, actually, yeah, because one of the stories you mentioned earlier, I thought about that because, and that was right when I started hunting out there by myself, and you were like, yeah, it's just right here, like you sit. And where you were telling me, I was like, is that right? And I went out there one time, and I'm like, I think this is where he's talking about. And I was sitting there, and I was like, I was there for like, it, it got to be like 7 a.m. I was like, man, this is dumb, because I've had some people drive by. I'm like, I'm in the wrong spot. And I look up, and there's a deer crossing out in front of me. And I'm like, I'll be danged. And I think you ended up killing a, a buck right there, didn't you? Yeah. You yeah, killed a pretty nice deer, I think. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, that, that was that was one of the spots that uh that opened my eyes to just hunt and overlook stuff. Yeah, yeah, you know. I mean, there's a lot of land over there. What, I don't know how many acres now. You know better than me. Yeah. Uh, Andrew knows that place like the back of his hand. Yeah. But, uh, I, learned a lo- I learned a lot of things the hard way out there. <laughs> it's, uh, it's rough country. Yeah, yeah. But that's one of those good bucks there. Well, and that's, that's the place where I learned that uh, I ran into some old guy out there one time when I was like, I mean, I was like probably 16 and uh old guy what was he 45 or something yeah <laughs> 30 yeah he, 30. He's, he's probably man. like 38 he was old <laughs> yeah. dude was, uh, dude. Th- this guy this guy had been hunting out there for a long time and he said like something along the lines of like man some people go way back in there some people hunt right next to the road and sometimes it's best to be right in the middle and like the point he was making is is that even on a place like that that's real rugged you really can't outwalk people especially nowadays mm-hmm. you know because, uh, like, kind of the cat's out of the bag that, you know, you got, if you just walk further, there's, like, the bigger buck back there. I mean, like, that, like, I don't, I don't feel like that's the case everywhere. There's places where that's still the case, but, but out there it's not. And out there, you really gotta, you gotta hunt the stuff that people either just overlook or they're not willing to hunt. And usually, not willing to hunt is not a factor of how far they walk, it's what they have to walk through mm-hmm. or up. 
You that's know, right. That's right. Yeah. 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 You're definitely right. Yeah. And and that. So yeah, that was a that was a learning lesson for me. Well, we found we found a heck of a shed over there a week ago. Oh um, really? Yeah, really good. Uh, shed tight. The got the young guy something with me now. Mm -hmm. uh, he found a really good shed and uh, uh, he's got a bird dog and uh, he he's not a big deer hunter but he wanted me showing some places and so on and I showed him where the gobblers I knew were you know mm -hmm. and uh, so anyway he's a uh, uh, you would like, really like him he's full of energy and wanting to learn and uh, uh, so I, I'm enjoying mentoring him a little bit I mean, he's a good hunter, but he just wanting to expand. Just like Barry said, you know, man, listen to older people that's hunted while well. listen to them. You know, I mean, you you can learn. I mean, matter of fact, I listen to young guys. I listen to you. I mean, I I can learn from anybody. Okay. Don't ever underestimate somebody. You know, you you can pick up bits of information. You know, yeah, yeah fishing and hunting. Compile it all together, young, young, young knowledge, old knowledge, and oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Compile, compile it together, and you'll, 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 uh, it'll increase your knowledge. I can tell you that. Absolutely. Tate will tell you the the way I met him. He was over there on the management area trying to scout around. He's sitting on the side of the road looking at his cell phone, looking at a map. He said, "Man, nobody tell me nothing over here." I said, "Man, you come on with me. Let me show you some stuff over here." I don't mind doing that. I mean, I've I've had my time in the sun. And uh, and he was rabbit hunting Saturday, and was joking around, and he said Ben literally picked me up off the side of the road, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, man, he loves rabbit hunting with us. He's just a great guy. Uh, his brother just moved back here from Michigan. They both killed a rabbit the other day, and I I'd rather see them kill one than me kill ten, you know. Even though I did get two, Barry got two. Mm -hmm. Well, a good day. You need to show him a picture of that. Yeah, that does on tailgate. We had a good day. So. Awesome. Well, guys, at, the, at that point, I think we'll wrap up. We're just over two hours now. So, yeah, um, yeah we'll, we'll have to get y'all back on and tell some more deer stories and stuff this summer. I think it'd be a good time. But I uh, appreciate y'all both coming up and uh, doing the episode. I appreciate all the listeners listening to the podcast and all the viewers as well watching the podcast. Um, if y'all have any questions for both Barry and Ben, write in some questions. Write in some Q&As for us. Uh, again, we'll be answering some Q&As on this week's episode. Uh, and then, of course, you know every Thursday episode, we'll answer some more Q&As. But uh, appreciate everybody watching. Appreciate everybody listening. And we'll catch y'all back here on Thursday's episode from the Southern Outdoors and Podcast. And remember, guys, y'all stay Southern.